Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's December 15th, 2020, and I am over the moon excited about our guests. Um, I've been thinking recently about kind of a 12 days of Christmas where I spotlight 12 of my favorite kind of participants in the Mormon kind of post-Mormon dialogue and uh, just people that are cool, that are uh, making things happen, that are doing good things. And uh, of course, one of the first people or perhaps the first people that I decided to reach out to were... Zelf on the shelf. Hey guys. Hey. Hi. We love to be uh, two of your 12 disciples. I mean, days of Christmas. <laughs> Welcome back to Mormon Stories. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So for those You've had who, a glow up. What's that? You've had a glow up. We've all had a glow up. Yeah, we have. Yeah. You've got a nice hat now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Everyone energy. comments that it's an MLM hat. They're like, get rid of the hat, John. It's an MLM. Thrive is not an MLM, or at least not in my world. In my world, Thrive means. You can heal and grow and thrive after Mormonism if you so choose. And I can't think of two better people to talk about that. Yeah, you got us to do it. Now we're going to get three of our friends to tell their <laughs> friends. Tell us the structure of this organization. <laughs> <laughs> we love Thrive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, no, but seriously, for those who have been under a rock, about five years ago, if I'm right, uh, I met Samantha and Tanner, Samantha Shelley. Tanner Gilliland. I met them uh, at Utah State University when I was getting my PhD in clinical and counseling psychology. And um, uh, I thought they were so talented that in addition to whatever ambitions they had, I wanted them to uh, enter into the progressive post-Mormon discourse. And, uh, and so uh, they decided to start an amazing YouTube channel called Zelf on the Shelf. Uh, it was a blog too, probably still is. And we interviewed them five years ago. It was called, what was it called? Losing Mormon Millennials or something like, something that. like that? Yeah. And um, it's definitely <clears throat> one of the top 100 Mormon Stories episodes of all time, which is saying <laughs> something because there's like 1,400 uh, hours of content. But it's perhaps best known for being the tipping point or the trigger for Tyler Glenn, lead singer of Neon Trees, to begin his questions about uh, Mormonism. And, uh, and it's been viewed by literally tens of thousands, if not over 100,000 people at this point. It's definitely one of the top uh, interviews of all time. And, uh, and so we're just thrilled to have uh, Samantha and Tanner back to kind of update us on what they've been doing, how their life has been going, to talk about Zelf on the Shelf, to talk about uh, Samantha's coaching practice, Tanner's art, and all the other cool things that have been going on. Um, and so without any further ado... Hey, guys. Hey, John. <laughs> Hello, John. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's us. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the end in mind. Uh, where can people find Zelf on the Shelf, and how do they give money to it? Um, it will be the recommended video under this one. <laughs> Just kidding. Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel. Yeah, we're ZelfOnTheShelf.com, though we're definitely pretty... Uh, stuck on YouTube these days. Yeah, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're not on TikTok yet, because... Ah, sure. we'll get there. We'll, yeah. yeah, we'll we'll get forced into it eventually. And how do they donate to you? I want I want right now. I want everybody <laughs> right to give money to Zelf on the Shelf right now. <laughs> if you don't support these creators, they won't keep creating. So I'm gonna do the plug up front. How do people give you money? Patreon.com slash Zelf on the Shelf. Or PayPal.me slash Zelf on the Shelf. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah do that. Uh, if if we don't support our creators, they go away. John Larson gone away. So many good perf artists and, and contributors can't continue without support. So 12 Days of Christmas supports Elf on the Shelf. Thanks, John. What, do you guys, thanks. what did I get wrong or what do you want to add to my introduction? You didn't get anything wrong. Yeah, I nailed thought it was it. perfect. Yeah. yeah. Flawless. 10 out mm -hmm. of 10. Okay. You're coaching. Let's talk about that right at the top. <laughs> okay. What, what, what are you doing with coaching and how do people reach out to you? Um, so I'm a life coach now. Um, I followed in your footsteps and Margie's um, and got certified last year. I'm sorry, I'm like struggling to know what to look at, look but at I'm going to look at look you. At yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been helping a lot of people with religious transitions, Mormonism. Um, and I guess the, the bulk of what I do is helping people identify their limiting beliefs, their um, narratives they have about themselves in the world that maybe aren't serving them. 
Um, and I do a lot of work at helping people figure out what they want their new beliefs to be and then how to anchor those beliefs in habits so that they become a reality. Beautiful. So that's the gist of it. And, and I also do a lot of uh, validating, <laughs> you yeah, know, because we all have a lot of emotions. And sometimes, listening, yeah, you just need a bit of validation. Unconditional positive regard, all that stuff. Hell yeah. How do people find your coaching practice? Um, you can just message me on Instagram at the Samspo. The Samspo. Mm -hmm. T H E S A M P S O. Yes. You need a website, The Samspo. Yeah, I used to have it and then I just let the domain expire. <laughs> Tanner, you're, you're doing art, right? Yep. How do people follow your art? Uh, Instagram at Tanner G underscore art. All right. Yeah. Okay. Support these amazing people. And we have a whole interview to do. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to just talk. Maybe we'll have them give a brief intro. For those of you who haven't seen their story yet, they'll give a brief, uh, <clears throat> quick up, uh, background of their story. And then we're going to dig into life since our last interview. We're going to cover... Um, you know, Zelf on the Shelf, we're going to cover the apologetics garbage that's been going on these days, their love affair with Kwaku. Uh, we're going to cover, um, <laughs> we're going to cover um, spirituality, mental health, uh, you know, community, all the important things that you have to, identity, all the things you have to figure out you know, when you're leaving uh, Mormonism, but they're doing it kind of as millennial Gen Zers. And uh, that's oh, an important We got a slash Gen Z. I'm on it. <laughs> Is that accurate or not accurate? Yeah, uh, we, we, we like to think that we have Gen Z appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, who's older? Tana. <laughs> Gen Z. <laughs> okay, Tanner, give them the one minute, two minute background of your story for those who didn't watch. Like, oh, uh, Prior to? Yeah, yeah. The stuff we would have covered. Just okay. Um, I was an extremely devout Mormon and uh, did not have a sense of life, purpose, community, um, identity outside of Mormonism. Was extremely strict. Was focused on making my calling and election sure from a very young age. And so literally, was, not, literally. Not kidding, not kidding. No, yeah, no, that was, I was like, yeah. I will see Jesus before I die. <laughs> And uh, anyway, so just constantly reading uh, Mormon doctrine, talking about it with people, uh, reading books about church leaders, and uh, went on a mission, went to BYU-Idaho, where when approached with questions about the church, I began doing a little bit more digging and ended up researching for about two years, um, an average of like six hours a day. Anyone who's gone through a Mormon faith transition, I'm sure can relate to that, just the uh, uh, just ravenous um, pouring through podcasts and books and anything you can get your hands on to try to make sense of this new framework for your faith that you're encountering. And in my attempt to really uh, approach these issues with faith, I wanted to be the one who could answer the questions. They could say, all right, let's put these critics um, to, to rest and answer these questions and so that faith can thrive. <laughs> and ultimately, <laughs> it ended up not working out, and uh, I realized that it was not true and uh, came crashing down, and then I met you. And <laughs> How'd you meet Sam? Uh, Samantha and I met in college at BYU-Idaho, and we, did, uh, we had the same major communications, and we produced videos and things together, and then— At first, uh, it was kind of pro-church, right? Like well, we didn't really do our church Our stuff content. was just like comedy. Yeah, okay. just classic comedy. <laughs> um, though, Samantha, um, you can do your spiel. You did writing, like, yeah. deliberately Mormon. I, I did writing. have a blog, which will not be named, um, called Millennial Mormon. <laughs> 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 uh, it was trash in hindsight, but at the time it was, um, you know, fulfilling a niche, which was um, Millennial Mormon content um, that was... Well, we weren't edgy, but, you know, we would do satire and stuff, like good-natured satire about the prophets and stuff. But it wouldn't be – it would be very pro-LDS. Go ahead yeah. and back up. Tell us, your, tell us your two minutes. But, yeah, back up. Um, <laughs> I was born in England and what I – In Essex. It's a suburb of London. And um, I – joined the LDS church when I was 16, or well, I got baptized when I was 17. Um, I had a friend in high school who was Mormon – uh, they introduced me and, yeah, just got fully sucked in. It became my core identity. Give us um, the 30 seconds on how in the crud would a Brit in the new, in the, in the 
20 somethings convert to Mormonism? <laughs> um, so I'd say a lot of unhealed childhood trauma, um, love bombing, but, but saying love bombing feels, um, I don't know. Like, I think it was very genuine. <laughs> like the love was, was genuine. Um, and kind of being I, like, I wasn't raised religious. I've heard that late teens is a good time for people to join like religions and cults because it's where you're kind of confronting questions for the first time. Um, and I almost feel like my lack of religious background kind of helped because I hadn't thought through things that much. So, um, you know, I received like vaguely Christian teachings sometimes growing up because I went to brownies and um, my primary school had a vicar that would come in now and then. Um, but yeah, so the fact that it was like a Christian church or, you know, that, that sort of helped. But yeah, joined uh, Mormonism, went to BYU-Idaho um, at 18, um, was extremely faithful my entire time, um, became best friends with Tana, like junior year. Something like that. Um, and yeah, then when Tana was going through his faith crisis and encountering all this new information, um, I was hearing about it through him. And so then I was having, you know, the same kind of questions come up. Um, and so it was sort of a journey that happened on a similar timeline for us. Um, and then we left the church. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys came to Utah State for a while. Yeah, both worked yeah, for Utah State. Yeah, we both worked for Utah State. Now, would you have already started Zelf on the Shelf when we did our interview? Yeah. Oh, well, we were, no. No, no. We, no. Well, oh, when, we, just, when we did the interview, well, yes, but not when poem, we met you. But yeah. it wasn't like, it was Zelf on the Shelf. It was. But, it, done but we hadn't really done anything YouTube-wise yet. Do you yeah, remember, it was a blog. Yeah. Do you remember that Mormon you gave us the, that you helped us get the name? Because mm -hmm. I, I said I, do. I don't want to take undue credit. <laughs> no, it is the no, season, John. <laughs> I, I remember being well, in that story. classroom. Okay, so I've always wanted to brag. <laughs> I love to brag. I love to brag. But uh, th this is the story of how Zelf on the Shelf got named from by Tanner the taper's Gilliman. mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. First, I remember my first meeting with you because you were doing the the support group at USU for people who are going through faith crises, and I think I went the first time without you. Um, I think that did happen, or I met with you. I think mm -hmm. I met with you. Um, and you were telling me about Lacey Green and how she was ex-Mormon and was doing YouTube. And you were like, yeah, you should do this. And I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. <laughs> um, so you were really like, yeah, you were our first supporter. And but then... And now we try to recruit people to do YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, <laughs> um, but you guys did it. Yeah, we did it. We um, did. So yeah, we, we had talked about wanting to do something because we had both been content creators. And we um, had some stuff, some ideas, and I, for some reason, the story of Zelf, I just like, it was like, that's such a good name. It's just concise Z, like, and such a bizarre story that undermines all the narratives about the Book of Mormon. It was just perfect. So I remember saying to you, like, I want to do something with Zelf, but I like, I can't think Zelf of. Zelf on the shelf! Yeah, and you, I was like, what rhymes with Zelf? And you were like, shelf, Zelf on the shelf. And I was like, I don't want to hear any other name. Tell me nothing That's else. it. Yeah. So you can officially take credit for that. And it was actually after one of our group, our group, Totally. Therapy sessions had ended, and we're all kind of standing around <laughs> in that therapy room. Mm, and good that's times. when it was almost, yeah, it was almost uh, unprofessional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Someone's going to use that. That's going to be on an episode I somewhere. They're going to be like, jo John DeLynn, a professed psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we did that. We did that interview of you guys. And uh, that was a, I just want to say that was a really big deal because. Samantha, I think your blog was decently well known at the time, yeah. right? Yeah, the ex Mormons on Reddit hated my blog, understandably, because <laughs> um, it was about because it was just so it was so like orthodox Mormon, you know. Was um, it apologetic a little bit, or it, it wasn't even apologetic? It wasn't even acknowledging issues enough to be apologetic. It was just like it was as if the ch like the church helped us with our SEO, for example. Like they reached out and wanted to help our blog, um, so it was just so pro Mormon. Yeah. And it almost reminds me of Kwaku a tiny bit because Kwaku converts in high school. Yeah. No, I, it, then, it's interesting then, seeing and that. And then, yeah, then becomes kind of a media personality for the church a little bit. Yeah. And Al Fox as well. Yeah, yeah. I definitely see myself in, well, different ways in each of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah. So, um, so what I remember, you know, my, my sister Julianne worked with Fair for many years and, uh, and I maybe still does in some capacity, but I remember her reaching out to me and, and just like, 
what's Samantha and Tanner doing? And Fair was super worried about you guys Hell because yeah. they went rogue. They should be. They, they were worried that they're like, oh my gosh, they're going to be coming at millennials. We don't want to lose millennials. Like we don't want to lose our young people. And I think I think you guys really <clears throat> tapped into something because you were the first millennials I interviewed, really, or younger kind of people. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of an open niche at the time. Like, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really anyone our age doing what we were doing, at least that I was aware of. Yeah, I feel like we went into it with this attitude of like, yes, I am anti Mormon, and I'm proud of it because I'm anti the coercion of women and children, and you know all these things. Um, and it didn't feel like very many people, like young people, were really doing that. There were these like intellectual podcasts, like Mormon Stories and other things. Um, but yeah, I feel like there wasn't that. Yeah, it was a growing niche at the time. So, um, so let's start with let's start the story with here. What what I noticed, you know, obviously a faith crisis is super intense because it's the unraveling of your identity, your meaning, your purpose. Can be your spirituality, can be your morality, can be your community. Super intense family stresses, and. When I interviewed you guys, I was a little bit worried that, like, is it irresponsible of me? They're young. Um, they're they're right in the middle of it. And now they're going to be, like, their whole thing is going to be kind of thrust in the spotlight. Like, I worried a little bit, probably condescending, but I worried a little bit that, like, I was putting too much on you guys or that you guys were taking on too much or whatever it was. So let's start with <clears throat> around the interview and let's talk about, like, what was going on for you guys and map the the recording and the release of that interview with then how your uh, your separate transitions kind of followed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because mm. yeah. it's because family finds out usually pretty quickly. And then old mission missionary companions and probably the missionaries that baptized you or you know, just all kids from school. Mm -hmm. Like everyone generally people find out really quickly. Yeah. So so update us. How did, how did it go? What was um, that process like for you guys? It was really hard, to be honest. Um, that was a really, really difficult part in life because even though there were some glimmers of hope, um, it was real world living was so new. And because I didn't want to leave the church, I didn't want to find out that my whole life had been a lie, which is a common misconception about anti-Mormons is, you know, people will get on our stuff and say, oh, you guys are trying to find all this evidence to conform to your, uh, you know, your previously held conclusion. And it's like, no, you, you don't get it. Like I, I, I learned all this stuff trying to defend it and found, and these are the holes that I found. And um, anyway, so it was just a, it was a really hard time. Um, I was working in advertising for a company in Logan and like was not finding that fulfilling at all working in this nine to five office, you know, selling stuff that people don't need. And, um, and I'm, you know, they're like, why, what am I doing? Like what I, I, yeah, life just seems so meaningless, so empty, um, without God, without community, because instantly I lost a lot of community. All of my, uh, friends from a, practically all of my former connections just dropped me and uh, like didn't want anything to do with me. And, and I had been living in Logan for a short time, so didn't really have an established community there either. Um, and got to a point where I was like really feeling done. And um, thankfully you had invited us to attend a couple events. I don't know if, was it Thrive already at that time? Just Different. retreats, faith crisis retreats. Yeah. And um, that was, pro <clears throat> that was really big as far as just feeling like, um, held by the collective support of other people experiencing the same thing. Cause we had met with, you know, some people here and there, but being with a bigger group of people and feeling so validated was amazing. And then also, um, making some important connections that later, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say his yeah. name or Richard, yeah, Richard Tripp. um, yeah, became real good friends with him. And there was a time where I just was like really just wanting to die. Like I didn't see the purpose of going forward. Didn't see anything that, made me want to linger. And I remember one day like leaving work early and just being like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And, uh, talked to Richard, called Richard up and, uh, he just gave me the best talking to. And I like really sensed that he understood what I was feeling. 
and uh, you know, he told me he's like, you're a, you're a creative, you're an artist, you're a maker, you got to make things. Like, what are you doing? You, you're you're not living your full potential. That's why, like, that's where the joy comes from. And I don't remember all the specifics, but I remembered like that was a critical turning point for me, um, and realizing that I like if I wanted a life worth living, it was one that I had to make and um, pursue actively, that I couldn't just be this passive passive uh, consumer of a lifestyle that was fed to me by others. It was something I had to find, a truth that I had to find on my own. Um, and it is, do we want to like... Yeah, yeah, you can go back and forth. Okay. Uh, kind of follow each other's timeline a little <clears throat> bit. Yeah. How much of that, Tanner, really quickly, was any of that, was that just the faith crisis stuff or was it like also negativity that came at you because you also told your story publicly on Mormon stories? Did, is there any way to even tease that out? Um, I I don't think so. I mean, I did, we did get some negative feedback and still to this day do like I'll get people from my home stake who are like, how dare you? Your parents ought to be ash are ashamed of you. You like, how could you do this to them? How could you do that? You know, that's just pretty common. And I don't know. I've always been able to, because I'm, was have been so just confident in my own research and in my own understanding. I I've kind of taken that in stride. Um, I'd say most of the difficulty was just the pure existential uh, weight of it all, and so you can ease your conscience. I don't <laughs> think there was a, any too uh, too much of any like negative kickback from having been on Mormon stories or. You know. Oh yeah, none. That we, I mean, our website was already um, getting an amount of hate before that. Yeah. So, so yeah, really, it, it was it, a it blessing. It amped up the yeah. whole thing, but it was like what we were going for anyway. So yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's been a really positive experience for sure. Yeah, nothing but gratitude for our experience with Mormon stories and um, the subsequent events and things that we attended. Mm -hmm. um, we've been all been really helpful, but yeah, yeah. The difficulty is just of trying to rebuild a life. Mm. Sam, um, <clears throat> and thank you for that, Tanner. Um, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm sorry it's so hard. I, I think I had a pretty good sense about some of the depression you were experiencing. I think you shared some of that with me at, at different points or another. Mm. I wanted to help. I feel like I tried to offer in different ways. You've, uh, you've always been but, uh, available for uh, a good word and good advice and a friendly ear. So thank you. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I'm glad you, I'm glad you made it through that. Yeah, and and it's good now. <laughs> <laughs> good. <Yay. laughs> we'll get to that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. So, Samantha, actually, we didn't talk about how much you wanted to talk about your your situation at the time and what's changed. I guess your marriage. So, I mean, I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that or not. Or wait, what did you say? You, you were married to Connor at the time. I just, I just totally. Had... Wait, you just said we didn't talk about what you wanted to talk oh, about. Oh, well, when we were talking about what to talk of cover in this oh, episode. Oh, okay. I didn't okay. ask you if you were. I just didn't want it to come across like I was like, yes, let's please talk about my divorce, John. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, no, let's I, talk about my I divorce. Just, I just realized, you, I, I swear, this is awful. I love Connor and <laughs> I didn't think about him until just now. <laughs> but as I'm remembering back, you were married at the time. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm not trying to get dig for dirt or anything. No, no. I mean, I, yeah, it was uh, one of those situations that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to where you get married as a Mormon um, and, you know, as children who have, I mean, I'll just speak for myself. I had no emotional intelligence. Um, well, it's all relative, but, you know, um, no real ability to sort of manage my emotions, especially the challenging emotions that would inevitably come up because I was just sitting on a bunch of unhealed trauma um, wasn't self-aware, um, a whole host of things. Um, and so it was, you know, we, we left the church together and, um, you know, we're kind of like on the path together for a while. And then, and then we weren't anymore cause it didn't make sense to be. Um, and you helped me a lot with my divorce. You gave me some really good advice, um, when we were breaking up. So thank you. If you had divorce advice, what would you give people? Well, what you told me, uh, I have a do many it. things. <laughs> yeah, number one, do it. <laughs> um, well, the thing you said to me was just that, um, you know, moving on from someone like that, like breaking that intensive an attachment is is kind of like chemically similar to withdrawing from drugs. And I just found that really useful um, just as a way to conceptualize what was happening. 
Um, but also my advice for divorce is, um, is mindfulness and learning how to sit with your feelings and not try and run from them. Um, or, or be a slave to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 React to them. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. You can, you can sit with your emotions without reacting to, without being reactive. Um, and yeah, like the emotions pass a lot sooner if you're able to just sit with them and, but it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Well, I've always loved Tanner and I, uh, Connor and I continue to love him. I, I haven't heard from him in a long time, but Connor, if you end up listening to this, love you, brother. You're awesome. <laughs> so was it, was it, uh, is hard, was it hard for you in similar ways as Tanner? Different oh, yeah. Ways? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the, the depression and existential dread that Tanner described is, is what I went through too. Um, I remember asking you for a therapist recommendation, Logan, and I did one visit um, and I just wasn't even in a place where, where I could even, in, like therapy, I, I wasn't even there yet. I couldn't, um, I had such little hope that I just didn't think a therapist could even help me. Um, yeah, and then eventually um, I was forced to confront my trauma and um, yeah, I guess just my whole life. Um, and I became more self-aware and I started to understand the different um the different things that had, that had dictated a lot of my life and how I responded to situations and saw myself and the world. Um, and it put me on this path of like refinding spirituality outside of religion um, and mindfulness. And that's been really good and really beautiful. Um, yeah. Eckhart Tolle for the win. Yeah. Eckhart Tolle changed my <laughs> life, yeah. I think he's not everybody's cup of tea, but for me, absolutely life-changing. I think I would still be, I, I think I'd be a different person without reading The Power of Now and then A New Earth, so. Yeah. Eckhart, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> now we, uh, we were in Logan for a minute and then we moved to Salt Lake. It was pretty, pretty quick after leaving the church. We were like, this is just a small Mormon town. Like we gotta get out of here. We gotta do something mm. else. And so went to Salt Lake which was a good move for us. Definitely. Gave us a bit of a wider, you know, uh -huh. wider view of what could be. And um, shortly thereafter, kind of took a stop. We had done Zelf for... Yeah, we took that uh, year off. Yeah, we Let me ask you about Zelf really quick. So, you know, I adore makers or creators in this space, but it's like most people, most Mormons that I know who follow Mormon stories are afraid to even like a post. They're like they're afraid to friend me on Facebook. They're afraid to like any posts that I make, mm -hmm. right? They're afraid to even admit to their friends and family. And for good reason, mm -hmm. because the way that our our culture reacts to anyone who, do, who leaves the path can be so violent or oppressive or punishing. You are punishing. just rife with apostasy germs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean... So that's most people. And then there's like, okay, there's this super smaller group that will like actually like share a post or like something or let anyone know that they've lost their faith or follow any of this stuff or friend me, friend me on Facebook. And then there's even a super smaller percentage that, that would ever even consider doing anything creative, right? Mm -hmm. That would ever like write a blog post or come on an interview or, and then and then of those who actually <clears throat> create something, super small group of people that would do something more than once or twice or start something and then fail or just quit. Mm. So like the no, if you if you want to like talk about the past 15 years, which is how long I've been doing this, the number of people that are still doing stuff, right? It's like me, you know, Lindsay's still doing her podcast every once in a while, Lindsay Anson Park. Think if it's on Thrones is still kind of going, but you know, a lot of those guys have left. John Larson's done. Like, yeah, okay, we've got some TikTokers now and a couple YouTubers, <laughs> but like, it's really small the number of people that can actually make it to the point of creating stuff and then endure. Mm -hmm. So, talk a little bit about like what that was like for you guys to to do Zelf on the Shelf. Um, and, and what it's been like for you guys to be creators. And, and I guess I'm asking, starting from that early time period, and then as we continue with your story, we'll talk about how that's evolved. 
But that's a thing. I celebrate you guys in 2020 because you're creators that have stuck with it and have made a big impact. And there are really only a few of us. Mm. I think the reason we're still doing it is evolution. And because we've been, um, well, I mean, that year that we took off is a, is a good, like jumping off point to talk about this. Cause I think we just got to a point where we thought, you know, our lives are moving away from Mormonism. We're finding joy in all these new things. Like our interests lie elsewhere. But before, um, before you talk about that, what was it like to do it? To just start? Oh, to just start? To, to, to create a YouTube channel as millennials mm. in a very controversial space where, where you're going to get slings and arrows. I mean, for us, I think it started as like pure solidarity. We, we just had mm. a bunch of creative energy. Our hearts have been ripped open by this experience, and we need to do something with yeah. it. Otherwise, it's just going to eat us up. And there was this community that was finding a lot of solidarity. And so what did we you have community? Talk about yeah. that. Totally, yeah, you reached like, out. Uh, I, I mean, the whole of Reddit was yeah. like so nice to us. I mean, you gave us a shout out pretty early on, which got a lot of eyes on our stuff. Um, but yeah, we got so much support from people. Ex-Mormon Reddit. Yeah. Would, would, did you start getting the emails of like people telling you their stories? And yeah. Yeah, messages. A lot of that. And, um, yeah. So there was, a, there, was, there was a massive community. And like Tana said, I think, I mean, I, it's probably just like a personality thing, but if you're a sort of a, well, everyone's creative, but there's certain types of creatives where it's like, you just have to be like putting that energy somewhere. Um, and I think, well, at least for me, it was like very healing making content, wasn't it? Because it was like. How was it healing? you were able to verbalize all these, I think so much of what's painful about leaving a head of religion, like Mormonism is you have all these really intense feelings and no one's there to validate it because mm -hmm. like you're Quite ostracized from your community. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're vilified for having those feelings. And no one wants to talk about it. Yeah. 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 Whereas we were, you know, sharing our feelings in a way that was not only, you know, we're hearing feedback from people validating that what we feel is like legitimate and also that they feel it too. And then we're also getting messages from people saying um, that, that our stuff is helping them, making them feel less alone. Um, Did it give you a sense of meaning and purpose? Well, yeah, 100%. Yeah, enough to at least carry through till, I feel like I've definitely Until acquired that then. outside of outside of being an ex-Mormon content yeah. creator. Not, <laughs> <laughs> Not that you need to find any to the end. <laughs> right. yeah. Mormon stories through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, besides just, you know, the digital world being all interconnected, meeting people live, which um, you more than anyone, I think, has facilitated um, ex-Mormons coming together to mm -hmm. share experiences. And those were really where we, I mm -hmm. think when we were able to actually meet people and, you know, they come up to you sobbing and saying like, thank you so much. And you realize how much this means to people because we were lucky because we had each other, but a lot of people yeah. don't have their best friend to leave with them. They're totally isolated. And so to just be able to listen to us sit and chat and laugh Shoot and make jokes, uh, you know, people tell us all the time, like, oh, my I watch one of your videos before bed every night and just like, like I'm with one of with my, a couple of my friends and it's like, oh, to be able to get, I know what that's like to be, to feel so alone and not even being totally alone. And so if I can just mm -hmm. give a little bit of reprieve, uh, some, a little bit of joy to somebody, then yeah, let's keep doing it, you know, directing our energy toward this. And I feel like our positivity in a lot of our videos help people a lot as well because a lot of the content in the space was like very serious because it was like this is a very serious thing like we're not just gonna make light of this you know like your podcast it was like we are taking this seriously because that's that's how you have to be um and I like fully support all of that content but I think it, we really were just shooting the shit and when I look back <laughs> on our earlier stuff I'm like this is not good like we aren't very <laughs> articulate we don't really know that much yet like we know how to tear down the church and we could like make a joke but I feel like a lot of what our appeal was was or, like our friendship and just like the the love and the positivity there the and like the banter and then the singing. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's like the people just want to feel, uh, sometimes I just think it's nice to be able to see these really serious things in a lighthearted way and be like, here are these other people who can like make light of it. And yeah, I could see why that was appealing. And it was like we said earlier, healing for us to be able to do that, to, to you know, metaphorically alchemize our crying into laughter, like taking that heartbreak and being able to, okay, like have a good laugh and, uh, and be a source of encouragement. I think one of the reasons we've been able to do it so long is that we've, we've never had the expectation to like 
I don't know. It's always felt like if when we feel like doing it, we'll do it. Yeah. And when we don't, we're not going to do it. Yeah. And so when we stopped doing it for a year, it's just like we don't feel like doing it, so we're not going to do it. And the, yeah. And I think that was really good for us because I think at the beginning of that year, I felt I had no sense of spirituality. I didn't consider spirituality important or I just lumped it in with, you know, religion and all that stuff. Um, but I feel like we came back because we were like, oh, we're finding this renewed sense of spirituality outside religion and we wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I don't I wonder if we would have come back, you know. Yeah, maybe. I think a lot of people after leaving the church, there is a period of adjustment where they're trying to find themselves. And a lot of people <coughs> do Push. just find a life outside of Mormonism and are able to fully integrate into that. And that's good for them. So cool. You've like moved mm -hmm. on and, and done it. That's great. And we needed to do that. And then from that place of becoming grounded in ourselves, because um, we'd still like through all of that, Sam was kind of keeping our social media afloat during that time. So it, you know, we didn't completely drop off the map. Mm -hmm. um, but after just receiving, and you, people would recognize us and, you know, come up to us and just say, thank you, thank you so much. And um, you get messages all the time. And we thought, yeah, we're, we're in, a, in a place now mm -hmm. where we can offer genuine, like, hope that things get better and that um, life is good and, you know, without Mormonism after it and... So that was our kind of re-entry into the space. Mm. I have to disagree on one thing. I think you guys are real intellectuals and witty and funny. And when I watch your work, like I recently watched your review of the recent Fair Mormon, you know, polygamy, Quaku kind of video. And you guys are funny and witty and talented and you're intellectuals, super smart and I'm just like... Just say good looking and call it a wrap. <laughs> and, and super good looking. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, we've definitely grown a lot. I mean, yeah, maybe like tiny bits of those qualities existed. <laughs> but I mean, we, we've like grown a lot. We were so young, when, you know, five years ago, just leaving a high demand religion. But you were um, intellectuals then. You were intellectuals yeah, then. Re were. Yeah, it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah, we, we cared about researching and reading and yeah. learning. So, yeah, yeah, it's always been intellectual. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, and, and I just want to connect with you, like you guys joke about Thrive, like there's only so long you can talk about polygamy and polyandry and peep stones and lying and deceit and faith crisis stories. And it, it, it really starts to really weigh down on you and you have to do your own work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I remember the point where you guys were probably kind of burning out. You kept asking, are we too negative? Is this negative all the time? Are we more than this? And you kind of have to have a rebirth. Yeah, and I, definitely. Oops, yeah. several rebirths. <laughs> yeah, 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 continual rebirth. But yeah, you got to start filling. You got to start <clears throat> replacing the holes and healing and growing. And then it's not just a a complaining kind of a bitch yeah. fest all the time. It which is all important. The anger and the processing and the negativity is actually important. You mm -hmm. lean into it, not away from it. But at some point. You, you got to start growing. And so it's been fun to see you guys mature over the past couple of years. Really yeah. quickly, did it ever stress out your relationship as friends to be doing a creative thing together? Or not? <laughs> well, I mean, not in, not in major ways, but I think it is, um, you know, at one point we were roommates and doing this yeah. and best friends. Yeah, that was a little And it, it does, it, yeah, it can be because it's like how, you know, I, like right now is the first time we've had a consistent filming schedule that we both stick to. And it's because now we like want to do that. But we've always had this thing of like, we're not just going to, we don't want to make stuff we don't want to make because what's the point? This is, you know, we don't want it to be about that. Um, but yeah, like if one person wanted to film one week and the other didn't, sometimes it's a little bit like you're not necessarily aligned um, in terms of content creation. And then it, and it's then hard it, to separate everything. And if they left a dish out during the day. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. So. Okay, so let's talk about, like, when you come back. Okay, one of the things that, that's most notable in your comeback, and, and I'm sure there's things I'm missing, but it was these, these creative videos you started doing, like High on a Mountaintop. And, well, first of all, everyone's got to go Google right now Mormonism and Me. This was Tanner's first kind of a poem. How would you, how would you describe yeah, Mormonism and Me? A poem. 
Yeah, and you did kind of a, a rough slam poem, a straight slam up poem. poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and at first uh, you did kind of a a raw version, and then I tried to snazz it up a bit with like audio and video, a light, <laughs> a light, <laughs> a, light. <laughs> and a decent camera. Um, but it's really, it's still, it still is super powerful and meaningful. But um, and I don't, and I don't want to short any other shortchange any other creative works you guys have done, but. When you started doing those, you know, some of those more creative videos, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Because yeah. that was pretty mind-blowing. Definitely talk about High on a Mountain Top. I just watched that again the other day and was, like, nearly crying. It's mm -hmm. so good. That came out – did that come out of Richard's encouragement and, and other things? No, or? that was okay. a – this was a later um, thing. Talk about whatever you want about that. Um, and describe like just it about the yeah. poetic crit making. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, the first – the Mormonism in me, it's very – just straightforward me just talking into a camera and a pretty like normal tone of voice um i had never in mormonism there is no space for the validity of difficult emotions like anger um anger contention is of the devil and so if you feel anger it's something you need to keep down bottled up inside of you and um so even though I was feeling very deeply in that, it wasn't, I wasn't even able to, though I could express in words my disappointment and some of these concepts that I was dealing with, you couldn't see the emotion on my face. Um, and so it was the process of like actually learning, like, uh, what do they say, finding your, my own voice um, and being able to express vocally and viscerally my feeling and not just with words. And um, so it was kind of, I, I've always been, a, I think most people probably are a bit insecure about their creative efforts and shy about putting it out there. Cause I think, well, I'm not, I don't want anyone to think I'm like taking myself too seriously here. Um, but I just kind of have had this attitude of like, I want to put it out there. I don't care. If and describe the main videos you've created just so people have a sense and they can go back and look or we can splice them in or whatever. Oh, uh, I did the Mormonism in me poem. That was like the first, I think that was first like recorded slam type poem I had ever written. And that just kind of came spilling out in like a day, just blah, 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 blah. And then um, a while later did another one called... Um, this is the place. This must be the place. This is the place. Um, what was that about? That was, I think, about finding my my ground in like my identity, my post Mormon identity, and f realize like I remember walking through the avenues in Salt Lake, and it was springtime, and I remember seeing the mountains and just crying and just like thinking about my pioneer ancestors who came into the valley and felt this like sense of solace and belonging. For the first time after having you know fleed persecution and you know, un endured great travail and starved in the uh you know crossing the plains and things and um to realize that i could integrate things from my identity from that story and that i could take that spirit and transmute it into whatever it was that i was doing and it didn't have to be um you know a believing member of the lds church to love and honor that and to feel connected with my ancestry um, so yeah, it was just, it was an expression of, of feeling grounded and, and alive and reborn and, uh, yeah, reborn is, is really the, the message there. And, um, it hasn't been a super popular video, but it was meaningful to me at the time. And t describe the visuals in some of these videos. This one, <laughs> we had like set up a cardboard set to look like a general, a general conference kind of vibe, had an organ thing playing in the beginning, like they do for conference and saw some flowers and things and walked up to the microphone like I was giving a talk in the conference center. And Did you help with this, Samantha? Mm -mm. No. Not okay. this one. Um, were there any other ones we did around that time? Did the Brigham Young rap around that time? That was time? so good. The talk Brigham Young that. rap. Talk about that. I, I remember. It's just a dope Brigham Young rap. <laughs> I, like, sometimes I'll like, get like this like wash of shame. And I remember, remember we got lunch in Logan and you're like, what would you do right now if you could do anything? And I was like, I'd be a rapper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
really good rapper though. It's just a shame he's white. <laughs> Did you see the Saturday Night Live skit this this week about rappers, white white rappers? No, mm-hmm. I'm gonna check that. Oh, I, th- I think I saw uh, Pete. What's his name on it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think if you watch the Brigham Young, like Tana oh, is it's good. so good at yeah, writing yeah. rap. I don't know Quaker said it was pretty bad. Yeah, but the other guy <laughs> said it was pretty good. Yeah. Even the other guy was like, "Are you sure that this isn't?" Just I'm team uh, other guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So did like a Brigham Young rap that was a lot of fun with a buddy. And, and Joseph it, Smith rap as well. Yeah. Um, but these are then, cinematic too. They have nice cameras and you're dressed up and. Yeah, a little bit more fun and a little bit higher production value. And then uh, the the biggest one was the High on a Mountain Top, and that was uh, um, honestly. Uh, uh, it's kind of a, a creative surprise. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of like um, realizing you had undergone traumatic experience and never having registered as yeah, registered it absolutely. as a traumatic experience. I have, yeah. And then um, all of a sudden you're forced to confront this, and that's kind of what happened to me. I thought I had you know moved, healed most of my Mormon trauma. And was like, you know, had found that good fitting, had footing, had been reborn, was feeling groovy. And then all of a sudden this this thing came up and just leveled me and uh, was um, really affected uh, my relationships. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, when you're forced to, like, reevaluate the past, your, your sense of sense of reality is questioned because you're like, I had this whole narrative that all of a sudden I have to like unpack and uh, dissect and I don't know what to believe is real anymore. And um, I, I, that was another song that just like came just screaming out of me. Um, and it's funny, I had a, uh, there's a, a scene in the video of, um, a gentleman uh, washing my feet and the day that I had recorded it with that imagery in mind, um, I like woke up, had the thing ready to go and then saw Sam Young on in Temple Square washing the feet of uh, grooming victims of the LDS church and I just burst into tears and sent him like a demo of it. it was probably pretty bad, um, but I was like, it's just weird timing, um, and uh, just kind of explained to him what I was envisioning for this project, and like, you couldn't have nailed this imagery any better, and uh, so yeah, that was a, that was a, one of those like, pieces that was a little bit more artistic, um, and a an opportunity for me to, again, like find voice to, to speak the things that, um, I hadn't been able to speak to, to scream the things that I hadn't been able to scream. And, um, that was really powerful for me. And, um, I'm grateful that so many people have been touched by it and have appreciated that because it really did come from straight from the heart. Yeah, and for those of you who haven't seen these, just Google them. Uh, they're super powerful. <clears throat> I mean, they're art you know, in the true sense of art. And you will feel inspired. You will feel shocked. You will feel moved, touched. Uh, this is intense art in, in all the best ways. Thanks. Yeah. So, Samantha, um, have you had any creative pursuits kind of analogous to, to these sorts of things that Tanner's done? I know that... I know that you sing and play the guitar and you're a wonderful singer. I've always loved mm-hmm. hearing Thank that. You. Have you even tried to venture or had any projects comparable to, to these? Yeah. Um, I released a song last year on the streaming platforms. That's right. Yeah, called, There's nothing else, just all of this. I um, say it again. There's nothing else, just all of this. Yes. I listened. That's so good. Um, How many listens? I forgot about that. It has like that. a ton of listens. I'm it was it my right first now. song. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Spotify. I Under have Samantha Shelley. Samantha Shelley. Yeah. Um, e- I'm E-Y-S-H-E-L-L-E-Y. E-Y yeah. on Shelley. Um, I have two songs in production right now, two different producers that I'm working with. 
This has um, twenty two thousand eight hundred and seventy eight yeah. listens on yeah. Spotify for a first song. That's pretty impressive. It's we'll a bop, a link. kind of. We'll <laughs> in the show notes. If you like to dance, um, yeah. So that song was inspired by a lot of Rumi's poetry, which um, yeah. really helped me a lot. Um, or I, I maybe not necessarily help me, but put into words things that um, like concepts that I was kind of learning for the first time. It's so nice when you find a writer or someone who can like encapsulate that in words better than you can. Um, so yeah, and then music happening right now, trying to improve. Um, we've both been on a big uh, sort of creative awakening journey where we've had to, um, cause I think so much of our society is set up in a way that kind of represses people's creativity. So a lot of people will say, I'm not a creative person. Um, or I mean, growing up in England, there was this idea that unless you are really, really good at something like let's say music, um, you shouldn't really put your time and attention there unless it can become profitable. And so there's all these ways that we shut ourselves down creatively um, and have all these stories about ourselves. And I feel like for both of us, we've had to like give ourselves permission to pursue music because there was a lot of, well, I know for me, there was like a lot of um, just stories about, I had about myself not being good enough to do it um, and it being like a waste of time. But I found that that's not true and it's really fulfilling. Um, yeah, and like working on music lately has just, I don't know, it, it feels like the most fulfilled I ever feel is when I'm when I'm creating. Um, and I've had to overcome, well, I'm still working to overcome a lot of like limiting beliefs around that. But yeah, I think just having the attitude that it's, it's great for everyone to create and to put pieces of themselves out there. Mm-hmm. Or well, don't put it out there. It doesn't matter either way. It's yeah. just what you want to do. The process is the end in itself, I think. Yeah. And uh, creating like ex-Mormon content was sort of a, a foot in the creative door. Mm. Being like, okay, we can like make some things that people find valuable. Um, we In the beginning especially, we were like super apologetic. Anytime we'd like make music or something it would come with this minute long preference preface of we're not musicians so don't judge us we started out like our first video on our channel was a cover of Mumford and Sons Awake My Soul I I watched it recently and I was like this is so sweet like I don't know like we were musicians like we were young and you know the level we were but like I don't know it's there's something so sweet and innocent about it yeah and uh creativity is like It is a spiritual thing for me, Mm -hmm. Um, being able to to transmute, alchemize, whatever word you want to use, um, just raw feeling and experience and convert that into something beautiful. Um, And not always in like a traditional beautiful sense, but something that changes the way that you think or or feel or perceive. And that's really powerful. And we were fortunate to have a really receptive audience that's been just extremely supportive of everything that we've done Um, because we've branched out into some comedy stuff, into music, into art, and um, have felt insufficient at every point, (laughs) but just keep pushing. You know, we'll text each other like, I'm screaming into a pillow. I can't believe I just published this. This I'm such an idiot. Especially with like music or yeah, that stuff especially. Because people can be mean, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It's honestly like I feel like it was we were our own worst enemies because uh, I don't know. Yeah, but it but it is true that you could get a hundred positive comments and one negative, and oh uh, yeah, I can. Those can make you spiral <laughs> if they tap into something true. <laughs> like I watched that podcast where Quaku was like dissing us, and I was like, he should have just brought up my music. I would have been like dead. <laughs> he missed all it. of this. He missed, he missed a trick. <laughs> I'll look forward to that in the future. <laughs> uh, music, especially, I, I like. Uh, my most powerful spiritual experiences in the church were m- around music. We're singing in sacrament yeah. meeting and testimony meeting at EFY. Um, there's just something about it, singing with other people. And I think reclaiming that has been just a huge key for my personal, spiritual, mental health development. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, it's really put a, a we'll get back. damper on all that. We'll get but back we'll be back that. singing with people because um, just... I I love that to this day, just getting around, singing with a bunch of people, making music. There's literally nothing better for me. You're a great singer, and you play guitar, too. I just realized that. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Tom is way better guitar than me. He's like an actual guitarist. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you about uh, 
monetizing Zelf on the Shelf really quickly because I want it to be kind of a public service announcement. Donate to Zelf on the Shelf right now. Go to Venmo, go to I, PayPal. If you want to. No, no, no. You don't no, have to be into John this. Because so. Because we need to support And we do creators. everything Holy John, John says. <laughs> but uh, have, ha, can, have you even tried, did you ever try and do Zelf full time? Doing it now, baby. Yeah, yeah really? Tanner is. Yeah, I mean, well, between Zelf and Art, yeah. And it, it's able to bring in enough to kind of... Yeah, I mean, uh, to get by. That's great. Tanner's very frugal. Uh, yeah, I'm he's, pretty... He's good at... Uh, yeah. Um, so through, like, YouTube YouTube revenue? YouTube, it's, Patreon. It's YouTube and pa Patreon. Patreon is really... Um, I mean, we'd love to grow our Patreon a lot more, but, yeah, Patreon is, like, really important to us. Okay. So, and I, so right now you have to work and you're being supported by the by the revenue, is that it? Well, I'm not just a parasite. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we have like different sort of lives, that, you know, yeah. different ways of living. So I like to have a 401k. <laughs> yeah, an air fryer. Yeah, an air fryer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I had another job. I was doing, I was working at a restaurant because it was like, make me a great, delicious if you're in Salt Lake, go to Zest, best vegan food in town. Though the Rotopia we just had was yeah. Zest is great. That's amazing. Um, I was working there just as a way to supplement and make sure that you know at least all my bases were covered, that I could for sure pay rent, and then give me the creative freedom. Because that's the thing. Like I was working in an office, and I'd look out this window and see these the most beautiful, majestic mountains I'd ever seen in my whole life. The ones that my ancestors crossed the the <laughs> plains in the snow eating. Of leather strips to get to these mountains and I'm just like dying in this office thinking like why aren't I out in nature this is so absurd why aren't I making something why aren't I doing projects with friends why aren't I creating like this it's so stifling and I, I wanted just time to to lend my creative efforts and to be in nature which is a really another really important facet of my sense of identity and purpose and uh, like wholesome, integrated, healthy living is my relationship with nature. And um, anyway, uh, because of COVID, I lost the restaurant job and couldn't oh, get no. a, couldn't get on the Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, they had to let me go and um, couldn't get unemployment. Hmm. Um, so would sit on the phone for hours and with a you know whatever department that is and. Uh, yeah, I couldn't get any money, and finally I thought, like, this is a waste of time. I'm just going to go balls to the wall and see if I can... I I'd sold a few paintings here and there. Your paintings are great. He's Thanks, been amazing John. for ages. How do people buy your paintings? Instagram. Instagram. Damn, yeah. I do commissions and sell prints. His paintings are super cool. <laughs> and they're all about, like, nature, mother nature, anatomy, sexuality, <laughs> life, Great stuff, spirituality, nature, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Sam's always been my I, my biggest supporter in art. I, I don't think I would be doing it if it hadn't been for Aww. your encouragement. Stop. And she has most of my early my paintings. My house is just Tanner's <laughs> artwork everywhere. That's actually a great Christmas gift. Is yeah, buy a, a Tanner Gilliland, Tanner original. Gilliland print of his art. <laughs> we also have Zelf on the Shelf shirts. Yeah. <laughs> that has a logo that Tanner okay, designed. Yeah, we're, tune out. we're being too commercial. <laughs> we, should, we should mention our logo redesign because that's kind of a fun like part of our rebirth. We oh. used to have the the Zelf, the white Lamanite skull mm -hmm. with the feathers that we did in a rainbow flag as an homage to, you know, LGBTQ plus stuff. Um, and then what else was part of that logo? That was, that was basically that. Um, and then we would get comments sometimes about how um, using sort of a Native American esque headdress was potentially could be considered cultural appropriation. And Tana designed this really beautiful, I think it's a perfect play on it where it's still the skull, but it's got flowers growing out of it, which I just think is so, such a lovely symbology mm. of rebirth and turning something weird and hard into something lovely. I love it. And you can have that on a t shirt. And that can be yours for just. <laughs> <laughs> order now. Yeah. $19.99. And if you order, you get a Ginsu knife. So. <laughs> um, okay. So let's, if it's okay, let me, I'm going to just talk to you about, okay, when people go through a faith crisis, there are several domains that get eviscerated. And what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of transition to the healing and growth part. 
of this episode. You just clapped your hands, Samantha. Why did you clap your hands? Sorry, I was just excited. I was okay. like, yeah, healing, team healing and growth. <laughs> team healing and growth. <laughs> All right. So we'll come back to Zelf in a bit, but now we're going to talk about if you're going through a faith crisis, if you've been through one, if, if things aren't um, going like you want them to, or if you're in the middle of rebirth and regrowth and you're looking for tips and tricks or other perspectives or even empathy, what we're going to do now is I'm going to just list a bunch of domains and Samantha and Tanner are going to just talk about how they struggled in the domain and then how they to what, how they filled the hole to whatever extent they've been able to. Is that all right? And the first one that comes to my mind is community. And I just remembered that we started we started uh, Cash Valley Oasis together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As an there. attempt. It's sort of like, oh, my gosh, we always went to church on Sunday. We've got to still meet with a bunch <laughs> of people on Sunday in a big room and sing <laughs> and have and be spoken to. And so, anyway, that, that didn't totally work out. But community first. So each of you take a turn, talk about how 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 you struggle with community and then how you found it if you did it was a struggle yeah um i feel like you'll have more to say on this than me do you want to start sure um and maybe it is part of that is like being in a mormon like having grown up mormon right. where um like your ward members are your extended family and always having that to depend on being in and out of ward members' homes and things. Um, and losing that, as we've said, is just devastating, absolutely devastating. And, you know, we'd try to meet up with anyone we could who was out of the church, you know, posting on Reddit or on some app somewhere like, hey, any ex-Mormons in Cache Valley in Salt Lake? Like, just looking for anybody. <laughs> and um, cast a pretty wide net in Very that Very wide <laughs> Tanner would just invite anyone over. We had a couple. No, don't even go there. No, no, just interesting <laughs> encounters with people. <laughs> and, uh, We've had a few of those. <laughs> Margie and I. I bet. Our kids are looking at us weird. Yeah. <laughs> who are these people? <laughs> um, and accidental dates with old men who I didn't know were interested in me sexually. And He's like, come oh, so far. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> cut that out, I guess. I <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so then... I, I think a big... Let, um, let me just ask. So we did start Oasis, and Oasis kind of sputtered. Talk about, you know, if there, it didn't work for anybody in the end, but why? Mm. what you learned about about sort of that impulse to meet on a Sunday with a bunch of people and hear talks and, and be sung to and, and sing, right? Yeah, we definitely wanted to recapture the Mormon feel because, again, most of us, had been dragged kicking and screaming by our own conscience out of the church. It wasn't and I directly. <laughs> I haven't thought of that line in five Mine years. Is a good one, huh? <laughs> yeah. uh, but we wanted to, to reimagine the Mormon experience. You know, what if we all got together and we were learning something, but not instead of learning from the scriptures. Like TED Talks. Yeah, TED Talks. <laughs> and we got secular music that's also inspiring. And John's the karaoke guy. <laughs> yeah. carry, we're going to karaoke after this, you know. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to do that. But I, I think ultimately, like, most of us didn't want to like show up on Sunday. No. I think we just got too into <laughs> hiking. We would just hike every Sunday. Yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, go like sit in the building. Why? Yeah, like, why? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Um, I never really related to that because I didn't grow up Mormon. And also, I grew up in a tiny family, only child, single parent, two cousins. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't feel that impulse to seek out like a Mormonist community. It makes complete sense why people who grow up Mormon would. Yeah, and I, I get it. I've been to the UU and I'm like, oh, they're, it's great. This is so cool that it's here for people who are looking and, and want that sort of thing. Or like I went to Sunday Assembly as well and I was like, that was cool. Just not really for me. I guess it's I just don't really. sleeping in and brunch. Yeah. Brunch, <laughs> brunch. yeah, that's a big part of spirituality. Yeah, I guess uh, it really was just a matter of acclimation, I feel like. I was used to this sort of, lifestyle, this kind of ritual, and then I didn't have it and felt like I needed to just have the same thing again, just tweaked. But in reality, I just want, I needed to do whatever was mm -hmm. like naturally felt good for me. And, if, and so, like I said, being in, in nature definitely took uh, a higher priority than sitting with a bunch of people and hearing yeah. a talk. Yeah. Um, as another key thing in uh, Richard Tripp, again, back to save the day, 
uh, one day invited me to this thing called Ecstatic Dance. And he's like, oh, it's great. It's just these hippies get together and dance. And I show up to this, uh, here, just down the street here, there's a an old uh, Mormon stake center. I believe a stake center or chapel that has been converted into a Hare Krishna temple. Mm. And you go into the cultural hall and there's big murals of Vishnu and Krishna and, you know, all the deities and things, big statues and it smells of incense and they got mood lighting and there's just people just dancing. The only rules are no shoes and uh, no talking, no camera. So um, it's not like, you know, I, I, I don't really like bars that much, to be honest. Um, I, I drink here and there, but I don't really love being in a bar it's just not really my so vibe edgy. i know so unique. Wow. <laughs> this guy <an> <laughs> too mainstream for me <laughs> not really into the bar scene <laughs> but uh just to be able to like i've always been just a goofy dancer and being in a place <laughs> where you could just like freely express and move and get in the flow of your own body with a bunch of other people who are doing the same thing and no one's judging no one's talking to you no one's coming up to you no one's no one cares what you're doing you can just do whatever you want and to have that freedom, I was—I walked in and I was like, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And they do that like twice a week. And despite not... You still do? Not, oh, in, no, you did not during COVID. You did it for a while. I, oh, I, yeah, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. Oh, okay. Um, one, and I still do this. My roommates and I will get together and dance mm. like this. And uh, it's a pretty... Ecstatic dance is a pretty uh, big part of the alternate community, alternative community here in Salt Lake as well nice. as others. Um, but that for me was like... Yeah, rather like I, nothing needs to be said to have like a beautiful experience with people because it really is ecstatic. You, you you dance long enough and you build this energy and everyone's smiling and, and laughing. And um, I don't know, there's something really cathartic about it. There are certain types of therapy, just movement therapy where you're, exp you know, you're making your your subconscious conscious through movement and able to process things. And I'll, I'll find myself just weeping as I'm dancing and uh, so that was um, kind of an inlet into a different community that was one that was meaningful to me. The interesting thing is because you're not like talking, I, I wasn't meeting a lot of people, but at least I was saying like, okay, there's weird people out there mm -hmm. <laughs> who are doing cool stuff that has nothing to do with Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And that was really inspiring to me because it was like, oh, people like me. Um, as a Mormon, I often wondered where are the people like me, like who really just like, who believe it the way that I do it and who it's really real to them. And, you know, um, and I found that they're not in Mormonism, they're out doing other things and I just had to get there. Um, so yeah, ec ecstatic dance was a big part, um, getting involved in art and putting stuff out there and thereafter like meeting up with other artists. I live in an, um, an art collective now, so it's just a, a bunch of creative people. Community. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, um, and it's been a blessing during COVID because, you know, we haven't been able to be out as much and mingling with people, but having a, a group of people at home who are excited about making things and doing things and um, has been, been really great. <clears throat> um, I attended a song. I, I went traveling with a friend um, to Hawaii uh, like two years ago and heard about this singing festival. Like I said, I'm just nuts for singing and went to this festival and ended up being like a literal dream. Like I just cried for three days straight thinking this was the best thing I have ever experienced. Everyone was just sitting around and singing together, Just right? singing in the woods. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, there was a point where I, I met a, I was sitting in this uh, little tent area and there was a guy there about my age and we start talking. He had been a Jehovah Witness and... Um, he, you know, we talked about like, oh, when we'd see the Jehovah Witnesses on the street as Mormon missionaries, we'd be like, oh, we're going to beat you. And he'd be like, ah, oh, we did the same thing. And we just hugged and like cried and just said like, I'm so glad that you made it out of that. And it's like, ah, oh, spiritual cousins or whatever our family religious tree is. And, um, and then thereafter being like, okay, well, like this is something, a way to experience meaningful community through, through song circle and so that was just kind of ramping up right as COVID hit of, of organizing uh, uh, events where people could just come together and sing and play music and uh, had some really wonderful things. Um, our house is also, uh, has been a community garden space. Um, so people interested in permaculture, which if you're not uh, super into that, it's like uh, 
basically just trying to cultivate food in a way that uh, uh, works with the land rather than against it, um, planting things that are more native to areas that you live in, um, more natural techniques. Come to find out, I was just a big hippie all along and should have seen that in the Mormon church, uh, but never really saw that until I left. <laughs> and uh, so experiencing all, all that stuff and, and that community, um, some political activism as well, um, part of the effort to clean up Salt Lake air and to put some pressure on <clears throat> legislators who are making decisions that are polluting our air even more. Um, so that's all been part of of finding that community. And as I always say to people, is like Mormonism is nice because it's this like McDonald's religion where you can just show up and you know what you're getting and everyone gets kind of the same thing, same ingredients, all just kind of mixed around and um, not very good for you. <laughs> and um, the true work and joy of life after a high demand religion of, and part of finding that community is doing the things that you personally resonate with that personally light you up and excite you and um, naturally finding community around that rather than like let's just rebuild in the same way that this thing is going on it's like well what actually makes me excited is it hiking is it music is it gardening is it um, model trains is it butterfly collecting what is it and then finding the people who are interested in that like that is so fun and so meaningful and um, yeah has been just the best joy since being out of the church. Nice. So you feel like your community needs, do you feel more fulfilled from a community perspective now? Less? Oh, absolutely. Way more. Like way not, more. not even, not even a comparison. Mm, what? Okay. Because in Mormonism, you know, you're, you're with all these different people with varied interests and there is something cool about that. Like that, you know, I can be hanging with an engineer and a doctor and a bus driver and a school teacher. And we all come together because we share this belief and cultural identity. Um, but it, in some ways it's, it's pretty forced and everyone is kind of, you know, they make the commitment to, to lend all their time and talents and energies to the church. But I feel like most people are only living this like small fraction of what they're actually capable of offering. Um, if they were allowed to explore themselves and to create from a place of authenticity rather than like, how does this, uh, how does this support the narrative of the church? How does this make the church look good? How do I make the church look good? Like stop worrying about that and just feel, do what makes you feel good. Then you find your life just blossoming and um, living water flowing through you to borrow a scriptural metaphor. That's what it feels like. It's like knowing who you are, like your true self. That's what the essence of spirituality is. That's the essence of mysticism. That's what the the prophets and the gurus and all the spiritual teachers from all time, any of the ones who had, uh, that were worth anything, knew that that the encounter with the transcendent, however you want to frame that as God, as a universe, or just you, the highest imagination of your version of life, that has to be done on an individual level. You can't take that from somebody else. It's something you have to do alone. And so, yeah, so being able to, to meet and make with people who are doing that of their own free will, of their own individuality and my, my authentic individual expression, meeting them in that place is so refreshing because it's like no one told us to be here. We're doing it because we love it. And that is so much more energizing. You're not going to, I'm like... How many times did you fall asleep during the Mormon temple? How many times did you fall asleep in sacrament? You're just like, Every time. You're, you're just, <laughs> you know, you're punching in the time clock and trying to gather what gems you can from this meager offering and hoping that your, your offering counts and that you're setting a good example and that the Lord will count it to you for righteousness instead of just feeling fully enlivened by experience. And so that's what I nice. feel like I enjoy these days. That's a clip. I'm going to cut that out. <laughs> Samantha, how about you? Community. Um, I, I've always sensed that maybe you're a little bit more of an introvert. And yeah. Maybe you, you <laughs> the cats. A little bit less. I'm definitely an introvert. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things I could say. First of all, I think just making my relationships more intentional has been so big. Um, so I'm not, a, I don't, I mean, I like hanging out in big groups of people too. Um, I'm not, you know, a hermit, but 
Um, it's massively improved my life being able to, well, it's hard to connect with people authentically if you aren't connected authentically with yourself. And like repressing certain emotions um, and trying to fit your life into this little box saps you of a lot of energy and joy um, that you could be experiencing, like Tana said. And so becoming more conscious about um, like what meaningful relationships involve and what authentic connection involves has been huge. Um, helping me feel like I have this village supporting me. Um, and I feel like that's an ongoing thing. I think our society does make it difficult to like build a village. Um, but Are these just friends basically? Yeah, friends. Friend my group. boyfriend, you know, I've connected with my family a lot more since um, healing. So I just feel like all the relationships in my life, the quality of them has just like massively been amped up. Um, yeah, so I'll say that. And then I think, um, I mean, I'm kind of like peripherally involved in the communities you're involved in, but there's like local stuff I'll do. And then I think just like causes that that you care about are, are a big source of community, even if it's sort of virtual. So like veganism is something that's important to me. Um, and I feel like I have this like little online community of people who I only really know through like sustainability Instagram, um, but who I have like a genuine friendship with. And so that's been cool. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, obviously doing Zelf has been cool. That's kind of a community that we've built. That's been nice. So in terms of your community needs being met, are you feeling? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, it's been a weird year. I think it's been right, a, right. it's been a good year in the sense of, I feel like I have connected better with, you know, like my family and certain friends and stuff um, because the situation has kind of forced us all to. Um, I, before COVID, I, started going to the Buddhist temple in Salt Lake and I really liked that. I, I really jived with that. I love meditation. I love Buddhism. Um, so that's something I could see myself going to more, but, um, you know, probably not on like a regular basis or like a weekly basis. I mean, but yeah. My right, answer cool. was a bit good. sad compared to your like <laughs> transcendent <laughs> joy slam poem no. that you busted out. <laughs> different strokes, different <laughs> folks. Oh. And because again, like it's doing what you feel authentic, like what is authentic to mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think a big thing I'm really focused on right now is just learning um, how open do I want to be? Mm -hmm. I think. Um, Connection can be hard for me. Like I have various social anxieties that make it challenging. And so um, learning to accept myself more and love myself just exactly as I am um, has been really important. Um, and I think sometimes I shy away from community in certain ways because I don't want to feel this pressure to like be an extrovert or like be even like living in America, there's sort of this expectation to like be very smiley and friendly and like pumped up all the time. <laughs> and it's just not really me. So I'm trying to find that balance between like letting people know that I'm friendly and I like them and I want to connect, but then not like putting on a false persona. Um, so that's an ongoing yourself. journey. Yeah. And sapping myself, I do get drained very easily. So, and yeah. you're very good at you're very good at cultivating one-on-one -on -one relationships. Yeah. I coming from a big family in a big community, I feel sometimes like I can only deal with people in batch. I struggle one-on-one -on -one mm. often. Yeah, I and definitely prefer one-on-one. -on -one. Like that's why I love life coaching because I just love getting to sit down and ask people questions about themselves and like find out like the the deepest things about people. Um, in a way, you know, like their hopes, their fears, their dreams. Like I love all that stuff. I love getting right to the depth of people. And so sometimes it's hard to do the small talk stuff, which is I think why I didn't, uh, wasn't ever going to be Relief Society president. You know, I didn't have the pizzazz, the extra version. Do Relief Society presidents have jazz hands? Is that part I of think that? so, John. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. That's that's uh, one down. So next topic is I'm going to call it. I'll call it word of wisdom, and you Ooh. guys can choose what you want to talk about there. the 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 big bucket is what we used to call morality, mm. which I'm sure has a whole new spin on meaning now. <laughs> yeah, now moral, it's not just not. necking and petting. <laughs> <laughs> It's no, that's funny. You, no, <laughs> no, you guys go right to sex, but I mean, like, yeah. morality is that like judging people? Is that like excluding people? Like, mm. morality becomes a way bigger question than like, oh, yeah. did someone touch you where? And you mm -hmm. know, did you try a tea? You know what I mean? But <laughs> anyway, but yes, there's sort of like uh, 
two buckets. There's kind of word of wisdom stuff and and law of chastity stuff, and which is sex, sexuality. <laughs> so let's start with word of wisdom stuff. And because I, because I, uh, you know, I'm still like really, I, I've done nothing. You know, I'm still like, but, but what what do you guys want to share about anything you've learned about that kind of stuff? And you can, and Samantha, we'll go to you first, and then Tanner. But yeah. is there anything you want to share about that? Yeah, you guys can listen to our uh, recent Mormons on Mushrooms podcast episode if you're interested in our um, kind of journey with entheogens, psychedelics. Um, but yeah, That's I think... That's huge in post-Mormonism and, oh, and yeah, in the world. For good right? reason. Yeah, it's really having a moment right now, which is exciting. Um, Anything you guys want to say about the value of psychedelics? Um, Not necessarily yeah. your particular experiences or non-experiences. Well, I mean, I can just repeat what I said on the Moms and Mushroom podcast, which is um, I think psychedelics helped me um, or introduced me to the concept of reparenting before I knew what that was like from a therapeutic standpoint. Um, so it forced me to confront these traumatic early experiences and be the loving adult to this child that had gone through this that was deeply traumatized by it. Um, that was incredibly powerful, um, helped me develop more self-awareness, more, more compassion, a stronger connection to nature, um, a stronger connection to my ancestors. Um, yeah. And do you want to piggyback off of that? I don't want to make sure. Um, yeah, I guess we can, I, I didn't know we were going to go. <laughs> we just do a spark notes version <laughs> sure, if we sure. want. <laughs> um, yeah, I, psychedelics were honestly the the catalyst for for my psychological healing and um <clears throat> part of that was through the native american church i wanted a way to experience it like within a legal framework so i wouldn't get in any trouble um ultimately i'm not native american and really respect uh, that um <clears throat> that history that culture and even if I'm not an active participant and I'm really grateful for that influence. Um, for me, it helped me reframe my sense of self because before I was a spirit being son or son of heavenly parents that love me and uh, have a place built in heaven for me that I'll go when I die and I'll be with my family forever. And when I lost that, I was just like, well, who am I and why does it matter? I'm, I'm just like a, a blip on a, not even a blip on a map, a flash pan in a flash in the pan of existence and uh, ultimately the world is going to die and there's the heat, the universe is going to die and it's all going to be for nothing. This is all pointless and stupid. And um, <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. And uh, um, I had been listening to, well, I don't know what came first, Alan Watts or the psychedelics, but um, <laughs> definitely both helped me build a new intellectual framework for how I perceive myself in the world. Um, because when you really get down to who you are, you find that it's impossible to nail down. There is no center soul of you that exists in this timeless state. You're just, you're a process more than you are a being. Um, you know, you're a, a intersection of a million billion creative vectors, um, the air you breathe, the, your genetic code, the your blood, your the water you drink, you know, you're the, all these Social flows, systems, things, family systems. Yeah, yeah. all these flowing Nature. of information and energy that happens to be currently encapsulated in me. And I, I am the part of this process that is aware of a process happening. And um, the psychedelic experience strips away from you all these, um, all your senses of identity as a uh, an ex-Mormon, a Mormon, a uh Tanner Gilliland, a man, a 30-year-old, a, a guitar player, you know, all these things start to recede and you find yourself in a place of just pure consciousness and, um, and realizing that, that consciousness is something that is, if, if there's anything that's all existing and eternal, it's just that present moment and that you are all of that present moment intersecting in your body. And um, I, that sounds a bit woo-woo and a bit abstract and hard to wrap your head around, but, um, and that's how I, you know, when I hear stuff like that, I'd be like, wow, that's, that doesn't mean anything to me. But then experiencing it was transformative because now when I'm looking at you, I'm not just looking at this 
totally isolated thing that's completely different than me that has nothing to do with my existence. I see you as an extension of myself, an extension of the greater self of, of everything that is. I, I don't know if I'm spinning my wheels it makes here. Makes you more connected. Y- yeah, yeah. In, in like in a in a deeply profound, uh, yeah, a deeply profound way. Um, makes us kind of family a little bit. Family, it may, you know, when uh, what is a. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, being in nature feels like uh, being, being home, being experiencing yourself. It's hard to, hard to explain. Um, psychedelics felt like entering the, the Holy of Holies and uh, walking up to the, to the mercy seat and throw, ripping open the veil and finding yourself there and having this great hilarious laugh that it took you that long to find it and to be able to embrace and see yourself in all your perfection and flaws and love it with just the most profound universal sense of love that you can imagine. And it for me was the experience I had been looking for in Mormonism that I had been waiting for that at one mint with God. That's, that's what it is. It was the, that one mint experience where all things became one. And, um, and my life has been totally different since. And like I said, it's been the catalyst for, um, for the true spiritual work because they can give, you know, psychedelics can give you a vision, um, but they don't do the work for you. Um, the work comes from integrating those lessons and the insights that it's given you. Um, re- like that's when I started taking meditation really seriously because I said, okay, well, this is, this is how my, this is showing me how my mind is working and how I'm getting hung up in all these ways. I, this is what I need to do, not out of a sense of obligation or religious ritual that I need to do it or else, but because I want to, because I want to be present for this moment and I want to train my mind to be able to, to sit and to experience fully. Um, yeah, sorry, I feel like I've just been <laughs> rambling. Yeah, it's, it's a passion. Anything else you want to add to that, Samantha? Or? Um... I've lost it. <laughs> I'll just say as a disclaimer, because um, I think it is important um, in this realm of things to to mention that psychedelics are something that really should be taken seriously. I think when I first got into them, I, I was pretty researched and very careful and pretty methodical as well. Um, so didn't have any horrific experiences or anything. But for someone who doesn't quite understand what they're getting into, it can be a really, really jarring experience. People with... Um, a family history of psychosis should not, under any circumstances, use psychedelics. Um, even things like cannabis, marijuana, be really careful with that because it can trigger some really scary things. Um, you really want to make sure you're doing it in a place that's um, that's safe with people who know what they're doing. Um, really, we're living in a really incredible time where there are certain psychedelic substances that can be taken in the presence of like a clinician. So you can do like ketamine and you can do that with a, with a counselor, with a therapist. And so that is, that's usually my advice to people is like, if you want to get into this, do it the, like the legitimate way you'll, you'll have less paranoia about it and you'll be with someone who can help you uh, understand and integrate the experience. And there's a great book called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan that is a great introduction into these sorts of experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, not leaving the word of wisdom thing quite yet, There, the big fear instilled in me and all Mormons everywhere is that if you experiment with drugs or alcohol, you become a drug addict and an alcoholic and you wreck your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Samantha, what, what, are your, what are your observations about those fears and and the reality that you've experienced since? Um, Well, as far as I know, I mean, with any drug or alcohol, um, like addiction isn't, you you don't become an addict by taking something once. It's like addiction is, what do they say? Um, It's more about a lack of connection or it's about unhealed pain. It's so instead of asking people like, um, you know, why the drug, ask why the pain, because if for someone to become an addict is generally something they're trying to numb out from. Um, And obviously, like with drugs, there's a whole spectrum, you know, there are drugs that are chemically addictive that 
probably shouldn't touch um, and that are harmful. And then there are entheogenic substances that can be so life enhancing and mind expanding um, and healing. So I, I think it's just all about being well researched. Um, and like Tana said, like being kind of methodical sometimes and or all the time. Um, yeah. Is there a healthy place for those sorts of things from yeah, your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Drugs and alcohol? Yeah, I think so. I mean, not just drugs, blanket, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not into right. heroin no or meth, cocaine. No heroin <laughs> yeah. Cocaine, like, um, I mean, even no those crack. things have like some medicinal, like there is Under a place for, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, and I'm, Opiates. I'm not like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> team narcotics, yeah. but. Yeah. Team Adderall, <laughs> <laughs> gotta get through the day. <laughs> Prescription. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and in the true spirit of the of the word of wisdom as originally given was a, a rule in moderation, not in abstinence. And so the idea was that all these things can have a place. You just don't want them to have the only place. And so like with alcohol, um, if you know, within a, a well connected and, and there are people with uh, genetic predispositions toward um, certain things. And so, yeah, it's like, be careful, you, you know, yourself and. And don't yeah. get into anything that you feel like might be too much for you. Um, mm -hmm. Though I found that um, that the f there's a lot of fear in Mormonism mm -hmm. about this, obviously. And that once, you know, because I, I had that fear, I thought, you know, I'd like every Mormon is like, I have an addictive personality because. <laughs> it's like, no, you're just desperate for dopamine because you're not allowed to do anything fun. So all you can do is eat sugar. <laughs> like. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and... Uh, and moving through that and realizing, like with alcohol, it's like I could I could take it or leave it. To be honest, um, it's good. I have a lot of fun with it, and it can really like uh, nice and up an evening. But it's I don't need it to like be happy. And sometimes it like makes me not happy. Like I I prefer to just have like a a clear head, and so I don't I don't know. It's I I think adults should be able to make these decisions for themselves and explore and find mm -hmm. the things that, that work for them. And, um, the, as far as, um, like psychedelics, a, a term that a lot of people use for them is, is plant medicine because it's really medicinal and, um, finding out the medicines that best work with you and that, uh, elicit the best, most healing and, uh, positive behaviors and uh, thought structures for you. Like, Find that out for yourself. Yeah. Okay, sex, sexuality. What have you guys learned having uh, having left the church and and been experimenting in your twenties and maybe early thirties? What have you guys learned? Nothing. Like Kwaku, I am a virgin, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a virgin. <laughs> um, everyone should read "Come as You Are" by Emily Nagowski if they haven't. Have you heard of that book? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What are some takeaways? Brilliant some book. Takeaways. Um, also, the erotic mind. I can't remember the author. Um, I don't know. There's a lot. Like with sexuality, I think not just Mormons, but people are just sort of taught that sex is just something that they'll do, and it'll. Ju I don't think it's there's enough awareness around like how much there is to learn. Like with anything, like if you want to. Um, eat good food, you need to learn how to cook or do you know what I mean? Like everything in life, if you want to be like good at it or or not even good, because I'm not talking about being good at sex. Enjoy it. Um, yeah, I like if you want, with anything in life, generally, to, yeah, to have the best experiences with something, you want to learn from people who have put work into understanding how to do that, you know? Um, yeah, so like eroticism is like a whole subject and and sex and that there is just so much to learn and it our society hasn't typically had that much awareness around it so um yeah i'm grateful for like books like that that can really um yeah they help a lot so you're saying get There's educated a lot to learn. yeah honestly read books yeah i think yeah yeah yep. <laughs> it's amazing how little reading we do for something that's such yeah. a like an important part of Central the human for experience life yeah and for health uh -huh. yeah. and I don't know that you can okay, I'm such a big book fan because I feel like you can't replace the kind of deep learning that you get to do with books like you can like read articles or I guess podcasts can be pretty deep learning too but I don't know there's something about books yeah. that I just think is amazing because you get that sort of reflection time and you're choosing the pace and you can stop and start uh, yeah um, I think the biggest thing for me with exploring sexuality is letting go of judgments um, 
Of course, the Mormon paradigm is to be extremely judgmental about all things sex and very controlling and every, you know, tempting thought you get is from the devil literally trying to destroy you and you're a wicked sinner if you think about this or that or do this or that. And um, to just let all that drop and just to observe yourself and what makes you feel good um, has been really, really cool. And again, a source of like my sense of spirituality because it's a way to connect deeply with yourself and with another person in a way that is like extremely biologically, psychologically powerful and using that um, power intentionally just because you don't uh, have to like, you don't have to subscribe to the traditional models of like religious monogamy in order to find great spiritual fulfillment in sex and relationships and to, to do things intentionally. And um, so I don't know, it's been a lot of fun Fun to just fun. It doesn't, it doesn't have to all be like so spiritual or whatever but because it is just feels good. Um, I I don't know. Is there anything like specific? Have you, have your, <laughs> have, has your sexual identities, do you guys talk about that at all? And has it changed since leaving the church at all? Do you guys talk about that or not? Or Well, when you say sexual identity, I mean, I yeah, how could someone's sexual identity not change? N like not looking at sexual identity as just like the gender of the people you want to have sex with, but... Any of that. You, you know, like you, we each do have a sexual identi uh, identity and like a unique, um, like eroticism is so unique to every person. So we all, it's like this whole landscape that we all have within us that is like so unexplored in a lot of people. And like Tana said, like judgment really um, stifles that. And yeah. Um, I identify as pansexual. What does that mean? Um, just open to people regardless of uh gender or gender norms hearts not parts i've heard it yeah summarized as yeah that's a good way to put it um because I, I do when i when i take away the judgments that i have and can just say like well, i'm just like attracted to that person um i enjoy doing things with that person instead of like what am i supposed to feel about this feeling for that person and when i'm honest i, I see that it happens quite a bit for a wide variety of people not like a majority of people, because we all have our, our preferences and this or that, but um, for different types of people, I should say. Um, have you guys have you guys talked about non-monogamy on your show at all? We have talked a bit about it. Um, we even talked about it on Sean McCraney's show. Um, I identify as polyamorous. Um, I guess I'm just your classic ex-Mormon, <laughs> ex-Mormon hippie. And what again. does that mean to you? Um, to me, it just means that I respect the sovereignty of, of individuals, um, that I don't pretend to, I don't lay any claim on a person's sexuality. I, I, that's not something I want to ask of anyone that you're not like have this contract, exclusive contract. Yeah. That like if someone, if someone ultimately feels authentically driven towards somebody else, who am I to like cling to them wanting, I, I don't know, it, it's, I, I want to give them the freedom to pursue that which makes them the most happy. And uh, I find that with allowing freedom, it allows love to blossom and flourish in a way that can, not to say that monogamy can't work, because it does, um, but it allows it allows things to not feel coercive and to feel like, oh yeah, when I when I'm allowed to be free, then I don't I don't want to be out and about. I want to be with you know this this person, um, and if I do want to be out and about, then that's that's okay because I still have this person and they still have me, and like I'm I'm not a chewed gum for having sex with somebody else. Um, there are of course, like ethics involved in that and that you should uh, have careful consideration for how you tread on the hearts of other people. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't really buy the like strict monogamy paradigm that our whole culture seems to operate under. Not to say that I couldn't end up in a monogamous relationship, like it's totally possible. Um, but but on, on principle, I always want it understood that like I if I'm with a partner and you want someone that's not me, 
you are allowed to seek that. I'm not going to put inhibitions or prohibitions on what you are allowed to do and the freedom and happiness and self-fulfillment that you're allowed to seek for yourself. I had a church do that to me for 25 years, and I'm not about to do it to somebody else. And again, not to, not to knock monogamy or, or anything like that. Um, yeah. That's just how, how I feel. I think... Yeah. Oh. Please. I was just going to say, like, beyond the question of monogamy versus polyamory, like, I think they're both equally valid choices. I think different personality types and will be drawn to each. But I think the most important thing is just each being committed to empowering the other's autonomy and empowering the other as individuals um, at, rather than, you know, making the relationship more important than the people in it. You know, we put people in these roles um, and then, like, living, fitting into those boxes becomes more important than like the ever evolving nature of human beings. Um, yeah, so I think, I don't know, for anyone sort of wrestling with that, I think um, it's almost not as much about monogamy versus polyamory as it is how committed are you to your own personal evolution and to empowering the people that you're in relationships with, romantic or otherwise. I love that. Um, I love that a relationship can be seen as a, Individuals and a relationship itself can be seen as a living organism that can grow and uh, wax and wane and can adapt to circumstances that you don't have to fit every person into this pre-prescribed role. You're either my sexual partner or my platonic friend that I'm only allowed to see and engage with in these sorts of ways. I like to be able to connect with people in whatever whatever capacity makes sense that is mutually edifying and empowering um, cause sometimes it doesn't like, you don't, I, I, yeah, not every relationship is the same. And I, th I think ultimately it comes down to that. It's how are you, um, how are you standing on your own two feet? How are you, um, offering that space to somebody else and empowering them to do the same? This is just a one-off. Do either of you see yourselves getting married and having kids and kind of the traditional kind of, uh, American slash, you know, uh, lifestyle kind of thing, Mormonish. Uh, maybe yeah. I think I'll. I mean, I'm from England, um, and I've been dating someone who's American for three years. So if I ever want to live in England, that's a thing. You know, there are like, I I don't really feel interested in marriage as a concept. I don't know, just for the sake of it, but it is like a part of immigration. <laughs> so that's kind of where I could see myself getting married and then um, kids. I've always, from when I was a really young kid, been interested in adoption and fostering. Um, I feel like I knew from a really young age that I didn't want to have my own kids, but I, w the time that I was Mormon was the only time where I was like, no, I'm going to have to do it. Like, I'm going to have to suck it up. But I've never wanted to have my own kids, um, I don't think. So, I mean, it's a possibility, but it's it's hard to know, like, what it, what it would take to, you know, because it's such a... It's a lifelong commitment, and it. Um, I'm 28, but it feels it feels quite far off, yeah, yeah to say the least. Um, I'm not really interested in in traditional marriage or traditional family. It's possible. Never say never. I couldn't have predicted how my life would be five years ago, and don't pretend to know how it will be in five more, or ten more, or fifty more. Um, I don't think I want kids. Uh, that's just where I am now. I could see myself having, um, there's something cool about like, um, about like not the like legal process of getting married to someone though. Never say never on that either. Cause like maybe there's some sort of like, uh, economic utility or some practical reason to do that. Um, but what really like, ex the only thing that excites me about marriage is the idea of having a really big party, <laughs> like doing a really celebrating your love and bringing in all that uh, collective magic, your, your community, the people who are close to you coming together um, to, to communally sanctify a relationship. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, me too. And I uh, could see myself doing something like that mm -hmm. eventually. Um, next topic, mental health. Mm. Uh, anxiety and depression. Mm. A lot of people just have that as part of their templates. And then going through a faith crisis can be the impetus to a lot of situational depression, situational anxiety. 
I get the sense that both of you have had bouts of, of either or both of those. Oh, yeah. Any, t- any tips for anxiety or depression that you want to give people? Um, it's a, it's a big topic. Um, but I think, or resources. Oh, I have so many recommendations. I think that, um, healing is so important for so many people and our society doesn't have a way for people to grieve. Um, and so, so, you know, trauma just gets repressed and then it, you have all these maladaptive behaviors that you continue acting out throughout your life. So I think For me, I really identified in the past as like, I have depression and I have anxiety, Um, you know, like gave myself, well, didn't give myself, like therapists gave me these labels and I I took them on. But I think what I found is that, um, you know, I needed a lot of healing. And I think like anxiety and depression are like normal human states to go through at times. Um, I think the biggest thing is learning how to sit with your feelings because we're not taught how to do that. We're not given even that language as children. And we're taught to sort of, again, fit ourselves into these boxes. And and it's been a really long journey for me figuring out how to first even just identify how I feel because so many times we'll, you'll ask someone how they feel and they say, well, I feel like blah, 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 blah. And they'll tell you the story that they have about how they feel. But the root of it is like, I feel sad, like I'm in pain. And I think people need to honor that pain more. Um, and there's obviously so many ways you can do that. Um, I made a video recently on journaling. Journaling's a really big thing for me with mental health. Meditation has been huge. Um, Tara Brock is a therapist and a Buddhist teacher who I love. She's helped me so much. Her book, True Refuge, changed my life. Um, oh, there's there's so much to it. Do you have anything you want to jump in and say? <laughs> yeah, I I think my the beginning of my, like, Buddhist is like one of the things that I draw from. I'm not just like just a Buddhist, but I'd say my intro to that was through one of your events, both with meeting uh, Noah Rochetta, mm. uh, secular Buddhism, love Noah, secular Buddhism, secular Buddhism, Buddhism, as Buddhism well as podcast. learning from you about acceptance commitment therapy, which mm-hmm. was uh, pretty radical for me um, of learning to just accept, witness, and honor the things that you're experiencing. Like Sam said, our our culture is not set up <laughs> to make us thrive. Um, it's it's set up for the opposite so that we keep thinking that we can buy our way out of it and consume our way out of it and popularize ourselves out of, out of it. Yeah, right. pray our way out of it. <laughs> totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. I was so much more depressed as a Mormon. Um, <laughs> and so you have, to, you have to be able to step out of that mentality and witness your own feelings without without judgment because the judgment comes in an unexpected way sometimes sometimes we expect to be able to feel good all the time Mm -hmm. and that's not that's not reality if you you're not going to be 10 out of 10 every day you're not going to be a 10 out of 10 most days it's actually counterproductive to want that totally and it is (laughs) it 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 was that's what that was my problem as a mormon is like i'm supposed to be like thrilled to the bone to be like in the one true church but i'm just such a fucking idiot (laughs) that can't do anything right and that's why god's not making me happy because i'm so bad like no like that's not how it is um getting in more of a uh just an intentional approach to living has been really important um establishing personal meaningful rituals um like daily meditation Um, for me, uh, like singing is a, a, I I use the word spiritual almost interchangeably with like this concept of like mental health of a strong sense of personal identity and purpose and belonging. And, um, so singing is that for me, a way to like give my emotions somewhere to go. So they're not just, you know, at the end of the day, like an emotion is just a sensation an uncomfortable, or Yeah a sensation in the body and a set of sensations in the body. And sometimes they just literally just need to be cycled out through movement or through this or that instead of just being like, oh, I feel bad. It must be because of this. And just like getting it in and folding in more and more into the feeling. Um, Of course, there's just like the, the regular recommendations of like exercise, just getting enough sunlight, especially in the winter, especially during COVID when we're kind of stuck indoors. I have to like make it a point to like, I need to go 
see the sun today. <laughs> like I need to get some vitamin D in my eye holes or else <laughs> I'm going to be like having this existential weight that I didn't like. But I'm like, why do I feel sad today? I was like, well, I haven't yeah. seen the sun and or eaten like, no, a vegetable. No, it's not the SAD. <laughs> this is a real thing, and you, every winter it gets you. Yeah, and I, I, Got to I take D three. Don't mean to. I know that there are people who are like, I exercise, I eat well, yeah. I do this, and I'm still miserable, and uh, that's that's not obviously what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about my own personal uh, equation here, um, and yeah, I'd say those those are the big ones for me couple more things I thought of while you're talking. Number one, the book Inner Bonding by Margaret Paul. Uh, it's a book about reparenting. Mm. We've both read it. Um, I always recommend it to everyone. I just got, well, in, every now and then I'll get a message from someone like, I read this book and it changed my life. I just got one today and it made me so happy. Um, but yeah, it's about the concept of reparenting, which is like, you know, the experiences you went, I know you know this, but um, the experiences you went through as a child and the trauma that you went through, like that version of you that you were as a child is still like in you somewhere. Um, and you know, we have like these different parts of us. Um, and it, it's like about reconnecting with, with your inner child and being able to sort of like work in harmony with them. Cause a lot of the time when we're freaking out, our inner child is like, ah, we are so scared right now. And then if you can come in as like a loving adult and say, well, it's okay because this, and here's what we're going to do. And like provide that comfort to yourself that you weren't like conditioned to you know, like uh, most of us didn't have parents who taught us how to emotionally self-regulate. Um, so a lot of us just like repress stuff down. Um, so yeah, inner bonding. And then also I read this book called Burnout, which is also by Emily Nagoski, who wrote Come As You Are and her sister, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the secrets to unlocking the stress response cycle. And one thing in it that she wrote that was really powerful for me was she said that exercise is the number one way to complete the stress response cycle. And like reading it in those terms really made something click for me. And this whole year I've been really um, on like a fitness and strength journey. Um, and that's been really cool. What do I do? Yeah. Um, so I do Pilates and I do weightlifting um, and like various strength training things. Um, I Started rock climbing. Yeah, I rock climb now. I'm not very good, but that's been huge. That's kind of like a spiritual practice for me right now because I have so mm -hmm. many mental blocks. Present. And so many stories about yeah. how I can't do it and just like a whole complex <laughs> about stuff like that. So that's been good for me. Um, yeah. I'll and add, hiking, and obviously. Yeah. I'll add one more thing, which is uh, finding a creative avenue. Mm. We kind of touched on that at the beginning. But for mental like, health. For mental health, mm -hmm. I think like Absolutely. being creative is a human need, need yeah. and uh, to feel like we're able to express and to uh, organize chaos is something that's very, very deeply within us. And again, we live in this like ultra consumeristic society where we think like, oh, if, we ca if I can't make a living off this, it's not worth doing or I can't do it well, so it's not worth doing and that we just like have to scrap those narratives if we want to survive individually and collectively because making and creating and sharing are all parts like an innate part of being human. Yeah. And so if we're not creating, we're disconnected from a part of our nature. So finding something that like, if you're interested in making something, explore it, do it. Mm -hmm. Like the only one holding you back is yourself. Like knowing is, can give you permission to do it, but you. I love it. Uh, while we're on this topic of kind of mental health, health, I'm just going to, my listeners have no idea about this, but I recently lost 27 pounds. And uh, part of it is from just changing my diet. And you guys have been vegetarians or vegans for quite some time. I'm 51. I love meat. I love food. I love ice cream. I love all the things that are not healthy. And I carry You've it got all. it all, John, on the <laughs> vegan side. <laughs> and I carried a lot of extra weight for a long, long time. And it affected me in a lot of ways. Carrying extra weight around, mm -hmm. you know, clogged nasal passages, a constant cough, phlegm in my throat. And my brother just really got into veganism recently, lost like 50 or 60 pounds, something crazy like that. And, uh, it took me a little bit to even get interested, but I, I started eating more of a plant-based diet and it's, I've lost 27 pounds. I breathe clearly out of my nose. I don't feel sluggish. I don't nap as much. <laughs> I sleep better. Sex is better. Like everything's better when I'm <laughs> not 27 pounds lighter. 
And I feel better eating less meat, less dairy, um, less sugar. Uh, and, and, and so is, is what you eat an important part of your physical and mental health? And if so, just talk a little bit about that. Oh my God. Yes. I'm so passionate about this. Um, well, I mean, I think cultivating love for yourself. Part of that is caring for your body as best you can. Um, and it, this is another thing where I feel like we are not taught how to nourish our bodies properly. There's so much, well, there's so much processed food that is heavily subsidized by the government and there's a whole corruption there. And then there's also diet culture, which is, um, you know, this enormous industry that just doesn't work and, you know, gets people stuck, stuck in these cycles of self-hatred and like yo-yo dieting and all this stuff. And it fucks up their relationship with food and their own bodies. And I've experienced that a lot in my life. And, um, for me, well, I went vegan for like all of the reasons that someone goes vegan, which is, um, you know, the environment and animal rights and health. Um, I'd say, now it's animal rights are like my main sort of thing. I think about, um, Talk just about a new, new morality, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were taught to care about that. <laughs> I just say that cause I think like, you know, plant-based diets are definitely like the healthiest diets, but that could include a little bit of meat and still be very healthy. So, um, but where was I going with this? What were we talking about? Health, mental health, <laughs> physical health. <laughs> it's growth. apparently it's not very good for my <laughs> being sharp. Vegan. I, th I think it's just very obvious that like, if, if our body is a machine, then the type of fuel we're putting into it matters. Like it will make a difference. If you're putting garbage into your system, it's going to make you feel like garbage. You're going to be like, <laughs> that will be your, your output for, will match the input. And so, um, part of, it's a radical act of self love to feed yourself. Um, I, I've had like disordered eating, um, I don't know if I've never been like diagnosed with an eating disorder, like capital letters, but, uh, definitely. And, um, and Mormonism honestly has played into that for my mission, especially, and, um, tied up with some scarcity hangups that I have. Like I don't have enough resources, therefore I can't spend the money on food. Um, I'm too sad. Nothing feels good. I don't want to eat. Um, and especially through that, through reading the book, uh, inner bonding that Samantha mentioned and t practicing internal dialoguing with myself and for, for viewing myself as both like an adult that has to meet my responsibilities and as a child that needs to be like deeply loved and cared for. And from a more like abstract spiritual approach, like, um, being the object of my own veneration that I want to prepare my, for myself, the best of things to eat so that I can do the, my work, my, you know, the offering of my life as a, as a, uh, catalyst or messenger of, of love and, um, good, you know, all the good things, peace and joy and all that. Um, I, I have to be able to, to be able to do that, to show up for myself, to provide for myself, to eat in a way that will allow me to live the kind of life that I, I want. And so, yeah, definitely a key there. Congratulations on your, it's been great. I love it. I thought I would just hate it and it'd be grueling, but it's, it's, I really enjoyed it. I don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. I occasionally have meat. I occasionally have eggs. I occasionally, I really don't have ice cream, even though I love it. <laughs> I had to give up coffee because it wasn't coffee that I loved. It was cream <laughs> and sugar that I loved. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the cream and sugar was not good for me. What about like, just I, some oat milk? Yeah, some oat milk, some <laughs> stevia if you're feeling, no, like you're treating yourself. occasionally have coffee yourself. with almond milk now. Mm. Yeah. But, but. Oat milk the, is better. Oat milk, yeah, yeah. It, Starbucks doesn't <laughs> have, and there's not. Oh, a, yeah. But but anyway, um, I just feel I just feel way way better. Samantha, I don't want to lose a thought. You you, yeah. I, I just want to see if I can. I jar. remembered it. You remembered it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So what I was gonna say is just those factors, specifically diet culture for me, really like messed up my relationship with my own body, um, with my relationship with food. So you know, couldn't listen to hunger cues properly. It's something a lot of well, a lot of people, but I feel like especially women who are like often more susceptible to the diet industry. Um, maybe that's never generalization, but anyway, um, going vegan and learning about plant-based nutrition has really helped me heal that relationship with myself. Um, and with food to so now I feel like I don't have any issues. Um, and I think it's, it was switching my mindset from this, um, 
like so many people have a bad relationship with food because it doesn't well there's like control issues because we are kind of made to be addicted to these processed foods that are being subsidized by the government and stuff um and are just objectively bad for us and then there's um you know food and your body it's just like an it can be another source of self-hatred and so if you don't have a strong loving relationship with yourself that can absolutely be a part of that or maybe even kind of like the cause of it um and so I feel like learning about food through this lens of um what food can I add to my body to um you know make myself feel as good as possible rather than like how little can I consume and you know how small can I be and just all of those messed up messages that we hear um yeah I know that for some people with a history of disordered eating, like veganism, you know, may not be for them or strict veganism, but for me, it's been very, very helpful. Love it. So I was watching a video you guys recently did where the topic of atheism versus agnostic uh, agnosticism came up. And Samantha, I almost felt like you kind of are annoyed by or hate kind of that discussion altogether. Yeah. <laughs> what I want to get to is a lot of the people that I work with that come to me for coaching, um, that they're like, what's the purpose of life? Like you were saying, your nihilistic kind of phase where it's just like, man, if I'm just a dot, a little cell on a planet in an infinite universe, what's the point? Life's hard. Why do I even bother? The church gave me meaning and purpose. Now I don't have it. I, I don't even want to continue. Like you get a lot of that. So there's the question of meaning and purpose. And then there's also the question of spirituality. So those are the two things I want to move to. But I think there's this gateway of like, well, you got to believe in God or you can't have any of that. Or, oh, you're like Kwaku and, you know, these these fetchers at Fair Mormon want to club us over the heads with like this atheist or agnostic. I mean, really, it's just a way to smear. It's just a way to take a term. And first of all, I've never in my life identified as atheist or agnostic, not one time ever have I ever called myself an atheist or agnostic, just because I don't like the terms. And it, one of the reasons I don't like it is because they're so polarizing. It, it gives people a way to just judge you and dismiss you and yeah. write you off. And I hate yeah. all that. I hate that whole game. Yeah. But I think these questions are bigger than just being able to be encapsulated in these these terms that are oversimplified yes. and, and made super negative. Yeah. Um, so I, I reject that. I hate that. Um, whoever uses atheism or agnosticism as a way to demean and smear people, you know, F you, screw you, go away. <laughs> Love you. Uh, Sorry, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But well, I mean, uh, having said all that, like, is there anything you guys want to say about belief in God or belief in an afterlife or any of that as the gateway to the, maybe to the two more interesting questions about mm -hmm. how do you find a meaning and purpose and what does spirituality look like to you after Mormonism. I think when people are taught to find meaning and, well, I'll just say meaning externally, then they keep seeking it externally. And that's why I think the question of like, is there a God, isn't there, is so important for so many people because it is just like representative of this notion that they have that they need to find something outside Tell of themselves. Tell me what it is. <laughs> so, Where is he? Who is he? What does he want? Oh, yeah. there's a, a, a guru, a prophet, who knows? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I guess I'll follow them if they know. <laughs> exactly. Like, what's the scripture? What do I follow? <laughs> yeah, and I think um, not to say that finding meaning is, isn't is about external things in the sense of um, it is about connection with other human beings and with, well, from my perspective, and nature. But it's I think it's finding the interconnectedness of all things, and I think that's what basically every spiritual teacher throughout history that has been good <laughs> as a tool is to recognize that oneness. You know, we're all just these interacting systems and processes and nothing's truly individual. Um, what's the thing you always say that there's like more bacteria on your body than there are cells there are in your body cells. or something? Yeah. That's wild. Um, but I think through realizing interconnectedness, it's, it's both internal and external at the same time because it's realizing that it is something bigger than yourself, but it's also like you're kind of all of it in the sense that you're connected to all of it. Um, I always think of it as like, um, you know, in the same way that like your kidney is just one part of the larger organism that is your body. The earth is an organism and we are like individual little parts of that. But like there is like a the earth operates on like a collective intelligence, you know, like in the same way that my entire body has more intelligence than just my kidney, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's so in some ways, is that spirituality to you or? 
Yeah, interconnectedness, definitely. And and I think a, or a big part of my spirituality is, I think when you realize that we're all just the products of our genetics and experiences, it helps you, A, forgive people and not judge people. Like I think Jesus was right on the money about forgiveness and not judging people because like people are what life has made them to be. And if you look at like the worst criminals in society, for example, a lot of them, um, you know, well, possibly had genetic predispositions to certain things, but then also like have gone through a lot of trauma. Like you, my, I think I read that like the, the, well, actually I won't say this, just got that out. <laughs> I was okay. gonna say, I didn't want to give a bad statistic. That wasn't true. Okay. Well, let me ask you this way. So I can, I can see a listener that is you know, wanting to write all this off as hippie mumbo, mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. Great. We're all connected. Like when I went to church, it's like inspirational talks singing in the choir, doctrine and theology that gets me excited, mm -hmm. community, we're, we're Jesus and, and the atonement, and, you know, we're going to become God someday, and we're working towards something, and, and uh, you know, testimony meetings, and studying your scriptures, and praying, and getting the Holy Ghost. Like, that's like people are looking to get juiced up. Mm. So so if somebody were to turn that back and say, well, Samantha, great, you're all connected. Do you, where do you get the juice? Yeah, where's the you know juice? What, I mean? what do where's you do with juice? it? Yeah, I, I think rituals and like and community things are important for giving people the juice. Um, but where so do you get it? I, what, me personally? Yeah. I mean, I meditate and I journal. Those are really big ways that I connect to myself. And I find that when I'm the most connected to myself, I'm better able to connect with others. And when my empathy for myself is high, my empathy for others is high. When my judgment of myself is high, my judgment of others is high. Um, so I think your relationship with yourself is like, is always first and foremost, because how you, how you feel about yourself is, is gonna affect how all your other relationships, like people who are very, people who are hateful to others are hateful with themselves. You don't find someone who like genuinely loves and accepts themselves who's hateful to other people. It just doesn't happen. So I think like recognizing that personal practices like meditation are like an offering to the world as well in the sense that like, if you can take care of yourself, you can show up in the world with more empathy and less judgment. Um, and then also, I mean like learning, I think is a, is a really important thing because by understanding all the systems that create, that give rise to certain types of people or maybe certain crimes or certain mental illnesses and like all these various things, like when you understand the system, you're able to be a more effective change maker. And again, I think when you kind of understand that we're all the products of our genetics and experiences, then you can start thinking about, well, how can I, how can we work to create different systems that will give people like healthier experiences that will make them like happier, healthier people who are more beneficial to society. And Love becoming, it. you know, contributing to that is yeah. like you do derive a sense of satisfaction and personal fulfillment from that. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, even, even like as we talk about, you know, the fair Mormon or whoever, and you're like, ah, oh, those knuckleheads, like at the end of the day, I don't have any personal animosity toward them. I'm, I'm not even like, I'm not even truly hurt by like, you know, they've done videos knocking us or whatever. And it's like, at the end of the day, it doesn't really hurt me because like, I know who I am. Like, I know what I'm doing. And like, I also can deeply empathize with someone who's trying to like at all costs, hold on to something that they hold dear. And so like, I see when I see someone lashing out in anger toward me or toward my community, I see someone in pain. And I'm like, I'm sorry that, that that pain is being directed in this way. Um, but I don't hate you for it. And, um, you know, should, should anything change with any one of them, I'd, I'd welcome them with open arms. And even if not, I still would, because at the end of the day, they're still just as worthy as, of love and respect as I am. Um, going back to the original uh, point about atheism and agnosticism, I think part of the problem with the, with the terms is like even the word God itself is so convoluted and that every single person has their own definition of what God means to them and their own relationship with that word. So you can't, it's hard to, you know, speak to every single person's personal interpretation of God. Um, you know, for Mormons, it's this bearded homo sapiens polygamist in the sky on, in Kolob. And, uh, I certainly don't believe in and that. his wives and his wives and his wives. Yep. <laughs> Got to make those babies to inhabit those planets. Um, 
I, I actually, I don't know if I'd be classed as a, as a theist in any real substantive sense, but I, I would say that like, um, going from that state of believing in a, in a somewhat traditional view of God, that there is a conscious being who assembled the planet together or from thin air or other materials or whatever your story is and mm. put the animals on it and put people on it and, uh, going away from that and viewing the the universe as, like Samantha said, as more of a, an organism in and of itself, something that is just happening and that we are a part of that happening. Um, so, you know, if, if nothing is divine, then the flip side of that is everything is divine. And that's where, like, pantheism comes in. So I'm just as much a pantheist as I am an atheist. Wait, how does everything is divine spring forth from nothing is divine? Well, if nothing is divine except for our perception and our decision to consider it such, then there's no no limit on what we're able to consider divine. But some people are going to go, "No, wait, I don't want I don't want to believe in something powerful and majestic just as a fiction, as something like I delude myself into. I want to know like I think this is the compelling thing about a high demand religion. It's like, "No, no, no. This is the one true church." You have a purpose. Here's what it is. You're going to become a god. There is a god. There is an afterlife, and it's like someone handing you the certainty of of something very powerful and cool and a big story and something to really believe in. Versus, and I'm going to mischaracterize what you just said, which is like, well, I guess nothing matters, so everything matters. I guess I'll I'll just convince myself that everything matters. Uh, versus being handed some really big story. How does that become truly motivating and exciting to you when it's almost like a decision? I think it ties into what Samantha said about the the awareness of the connectivity because in religion you do exist as this isolated entity. You're a, you're a spirit being and that and you're put your own earth. self. Not you were put on the earth. earth. You didn't come out of the earth. You're put on it. Yeah. And so when you're discovering, uh, it's a it's a practice of taking yourself seriously, as if well, if I, if I am, or you know, we are the highest expression of complex thought of consciousness. What would how do we act? If you're God, you got your wish, you got exalted, and He put you on this planet right here, and you're God now. What do you do with that? Like no one ever takes thought to that. They're just like, oh, I just want to live for happy. What they're saying is, I don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want to figure it out. I don't want to take myself seriously. I want someone else to tell me what my destiny is and not get too specific about it, <laughs> but just give me hope so I can lull me into carnal passivity or whatever the term is. It's really this, um, the spiritual quest is, is finding yourself and taking yourself seriously. And when you understand that all things really are connected and they are connected because you can, you can find that everything um, all these systems do interact, and if you you can trace them to their importance to you. And so when you go out into the world, you find yourself all over. And so it's this process of like pure, joyful discovery and um and intentional living of, like I said, taking yourself seriously. if you're if you're God, what do you do? What kind of life do you live? what What makes you happy? And when you get to heaven, is it? How, are you going to sit around and play a harp for a thousand, no, for you're gonna have 10 lots of million babies. years? You're going to have billions of babies. Billions of spirit babies. <laughs> That's the best thing you come up with. Yeah, so like you're just going to be having sex with like person after person after person, and then you're going to have to hear prayers from all of them for the rest <laughs> of eternity. Like it's, it'll get boring after a while. Like <laughs> when you really, when you really, really think about eternity and we're we're incapable of understanding or even beginning to comprehend what that would be like but if you really get into the the weeds of an eternal existence all of it would get so boring i can't think of a single thing that i'd want to do forever and not get totally sick of um so there there's a the the novelty the 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 limitation the limitation that in, uh compels the constraint that compels creativity um is really interesting in life. The the ephemeral nature of it gives it its value. Meaning you, we all die. We all die. So do something, like experience something, find you, you something, get this make miracle something. Miracle of life. Yeah, and follow following you your own bliss. 
um, I think is the key is like we, we just we're always following what other people tell us is good, you know, whether that's an interest in something weird or doing something weird or dressing weird or dancing weird or, you know, we don't want to be perceived as weird or different or this, but we all have these inclinations for things that make us unique. And when you follow those things and honor them and, you know, consider them with the same devotion that you would have considered your, your religious obligation to Elohim, then you find your life just truly blossoming and, and joy is a byproduct of that of taking yourself seriously and not seriously at all, you know, realizing the, the hilarity of it and, and being able to laugh at yourself in the, the condition that you find yourself in. Is this all too gobbledygook? No, it's beautiful. <laughs> Sam, you, are you Keith Raniere could never. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you asked where is the juice? And I think, um, like, I like to believe that humans are inherently good. And I think we're, we ha we are all wired to release oxytocin when we help someone, for example. Um, and I think they've shown studies of babies even like demonstrate, like babies are like good. <laughs> like they want people to be happy. And anyway, um, sorry, I'm like the queen of like quoting half I things it. I remember <laughs> and then like not really give, adding any value. No. But um, I, I mean, like with finding divinity or whatever you want to call it, I think it, it's such an individual process. Um, and I I feel like I talk about this a lot and it's kind of silly, but it's also not silly to me. But my first cat that I got as an adult, clickbait, changed my life because for the first time I was responsible for this like helpless being and it was all on me. And this was when I was at my most depressed and existential and nihilistic. And I- I, I knew and, clickbait. You knew yeah, clickbait. Yeah, yeah. It was one beautiful year that yeah, he lived. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, like I know it might sound silly to some people, but like clickbait really gave me a sense of meaning and purpose and a reason to wake up because it was like, I can I cannot take care of myself because I've been doing that for a while, but like I, I have to take care of this kitten. Like I, you know, I'm not dead inside. Like I don't want this kitten to suffer. I want him to live like the happiest, healthiest life he can. Um, and so then that like opened up a doorway for me of like, when I see this animal suffering, I feel pain. And so why am I okay with other animals suffering? So then my compassion sort of expanded to the larger world of animals and I went vegan. And then I, I feel like it's just been a process of, um, there's a quote I really like, it might be by Tara Brack, but it's basically just expand your compassion until it includes everyone and everything. And I think that that's a process. And I think if you really l start looking and seeking to understand your compassion will just naturally increase um, because I, I just think so much judgment is just not understanding. Like if we understood people's pain or people's whatever, if we just understood people, it's a lot harder to judge them, you know, because we kind of understand what's behind maybe even like harmful actions, you know. Um, so, yeah. I also want to say that like, you know, I – I particularly couch a lot of my language in spiritual. We use terms like divinity and all that. I don't, I, that's not to me like a necessity. That's my personal aesthetic, not <laughs> like it's, it's a, a, my way of expressing and a person doesn't have to be spiritual to be fully um, fulfilled and joyful and contributing and all that. Well, because some people well, associate the term spiritual with like spirits and supernatural and they they become, if they lose their faith or leave the church, some can become very, not, not all, some still believe in God or still believe in Jesus or still believe in the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. But others are like, oh, that that's all triggering because that's, yeah. part, that's all connected to an organization I didn't love. Mm -hmm. So they feel like, I, I don't even like that term spiritual. Yeah, you don't have to use it. I think I just think of it as whatever your connection to something bigger is, you know, whatever your meaning, purpose, you know, like we're all spiritual beings. We're all wired to feel awe and to kind of crave transcendence in a way. Um, and, I, you know, I don't think we should all be walking around trying to transcend all the time. I think embodiment is like more important. But And ultimately, I'd say that that is what the transcendent experience, yeah. if there is such a thing, mm -hmm. it allows you to do is realize the importance of presence and mm -hmm. embodiment that um, it's not in a form of escapism, but of like true integrated mm -hmm. living of real, of like, um, because we're so culturally into escapism, 
we, we just long to distract ourselves from the experience of consciousness. We have to be watching something. We have to be on our phone. We have to be mm -hmm. taking something. We have to be eating something. We have to be, uh, to, you know, we can't just, it's so sit hard to just feelings. sit with our feelings mm -hmm. and thoughts. And ultimately, being able to do that, and like you said, learning, I think, is a huge process mm -hmm. of that because knowledge is power. And the more you understand how all these systems are working together, the more empowered you are. And that's why I say I don't believe in a higher power. I believe in a wider power, that there is uh, energy that comes from understanding these systems. And the more you're able to uh, take in the good, the more you're able to put out goodness mm -hmm. and do it in bigger and, and better ways, I suppose. And it's all just so, like Tana said, it's like the word divinity is like his aesthetic or whatever. Like it's all just so personal. I think there are so many different frameworks of like operating under the same principles. Like yeah. even if you look at, so, you know, like I, I, I love Buddhism and then I love Taoism and then, you know, you can find these similar principles in all kinds of ancient religions and like modern things, you know, like modern therapy is like touching on so many things that Buddhism has been teaching for 2000 years. And yeah, it's all just like whatever you want to do. <laughs> like there's no, I think like the important thing for us is like there's no blueprint. We're not trying to say you should see all things as divine. It's like if you don't, then you don't. Like it doesn't <laughs> matter either way. It's like it's your it's your thing, <laughs> you know, like if you happen to feel like everything is divine amazing run with it like enjoy it but you can only like be what you are I that that's why I think the biggest thing is acceptance and I think that's presence and that's what Eckhart Tolle talks about is just accepting everything exactly as it is right now because like what else can you do otherwise you're just creating like an inner resistance which is going to sap your energy probably bring you down Attachment um, brings suffering. so if you're just like a completely existential nihilist like okay that's where you're at. Like, what good does it do to, I mean, it's good to feel hopeful that you can go beyond that if you want to, but it doesn't do any good to, I don't know, feel like you should feel some other way if you don't. Amen. How do you guys think about death in the afterlife now? I'm not too worried about it. I wasn't worried about it before I was born. <laughs> and <laughs> I assume it'll be the same way afterward. Um, I, those having those um, experience with psychedelics, I think, took a big fear of that away from me. Not that there's not a, still a, like I want to live, and I am afraid of death in the sense that like I, I, I take precaution to avoid it. Um, but as a as just a concept, as an experience, I'll never really experience it. So my my focus is on on life, and I don't believe that there's that. The, the Tanner Gilliland will persist in any real sense, um, in an abstract way, like the things that I've made, the influence I've had on people, that will continue. My spirit in that way will, mm -hmm. will continue. But besides that, I don't have hope or fear. I'm not sure which one it is at the prospect of living forever. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to live forever. And no. I think it's. I think and if it's, I if I do, then I'll accept it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. for now, it, it doesn't really it doesn't compel me. Um, it's beautiful that we, I think, that we come into the world and you know we try and make it better, and then our energy gets transferred into something else, and hopefully we've kind of like had a bit of a domino effect or a butterfly effect or whatever. And um, I think a lot about my grandma who's dead and how. I really try to like take all of the good things that she embodied and like bring them into my life and then add to it with like, okay, I don't have to be like trapped in a marriage in the fifties or, you know, like it's like I get to take all the good and then kind of like go beyond the bad in a way through like healing and learning and, and growing and just living in a more modern world. Um, and that's really cool because I don't know. I mean, even thinking about my grandma, she was this amazing woman, but it's like, if you imagine an amazing person a hundred years ago, people probably wouldn't consider them that amazing or a hundred years from now, like the good people of today wouldn't be, you know, like we're just, everything's just evolving all the time. 
So it's like you just, you come in, you try and like do something good and get some, plant some good seeds that will be there for other people to enjoy in the future. And that that's nice, like imagining some kind of legacy of, um, yeah, just making the world better. I guess when you, when you, one thing we haven't said is like, I feel like a big part of my spirituality is trying to reduce suffering in the world. Um, and I think if you have that in mind and you try and do things in the service of that, it's nice to imagine in the future, humans who are way smarter than you, like reaping the benefits of like things that maybe you helped set in motion a while ago, even in some small way. Yeah, it's, I am excited. I, I think it's cool to be going back into the, the soup, <laughs> as it were, <laughs> like, you know, you think about what the <clears throat> electrons and materials that make up your body, like, where have they been? Where have these electrons been? They've just been cycling around here for untold millions of years in how many creative forms and currently taking this form. Someday we'll maybe, take other forms. Elvis, is, you have part of Elvis. I in got you. part of Elvis in me. I think <laughs> that so. Would make a lot of sense. <laughs> I came out with lamb chops. <laughs> uh, I think. So. Or Courtney Love, or I don't know what. <laughs> Wait, so who's Courtney Love? The one that I'm Courtney. Allegedly, Kurt. Kurt. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, oh, I was going to say. Oh, and and it is like, as you were saying about. You know, well, Courtney's in, still alive, isn't she? Yeah, she is. <laughs> but, but, you know, her, you cycle out your cells every like seven years or something. Right. Yeah, so yeah, she's yeah. probably scattered she's some gone. bits of Courtney <laughs> that have been uh, absorbed into the system, gone into the food system. I've eaten it or drank it. Okay. You We're are all at least one percent Courtney Love. <laughs> it says that on my ancestry.com. Yeah. <laughs> Microplastics and Courtney Love. <laughs> Um, but though, you know, the world is getting better, right? Isn't that Steven Pinker's one yeah. of his big points? It is. is uh, like statistically speaking, when else would you rather be alive? N- I yeah. think about that constantly, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Yeah. And, and I, I have hope that the future will be better. And, um, and knowing that the, my little contributions, even if they don't end up in a history book or, you know, whatever it, it, it's all part of the bettering of mm-hmm. this whole collective enterprise that's going on. And to circle that back to the Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel, (laughs) I just think when we get messages from people saying that like our videos have helped them to like love themselves more or be set boundaries with their parents or like just like fully help them get out of the church and now they feel this greater sense of freedom and like they're like having so much fun with their husband like drinking for the first time and like having all these like life expanding experiences, that's like the best thing. And I think... Choosing when, underwear. Yeah, you know? people get so excited. Like everyone will roast people. Like, well, not everyone, but I see Mormons and ex-Mormons. Actually, ex-Mormons will do it too, where they'll roast ex-Mormons for like being so excited to have coffee. Like why do ex-Mormons think that drinking coffee is a personality? And it's like, because they were denied this thing. It's like, it's not about the coffee. It's about this like expression of autonomy. And like, I own my own choices. And like, hell yeah, let them be excited about that. I hate when people like expect ex-Mormons to have some completely different personality outside of Mormonism as soon as they leave. And if they don't, then they're like uncool or whatever. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of projection. I'm, and I'm mostly talking about Twitter, which is just like a, a dumpster fire, as we all know. Um, but yeah, if we can play any part in like helping people live happier, healthier lives, like what is better than that? Like what, if that's not meaning, then then what is? Yeah, it's... When people come to me trying to heal and grow after Mormonism, you know, for me, it often it comes down to everything we've already talked about, and meaning and purpose is just a really big thing. And for me, it's always like, yeah, I was depressed, and then I started Mormon stories, and it's been super hard. But it, now I just every day, it's like, who do I help today? How do I alleviate suffering today? How do I bless people's lives today? How do I give people their lives back today? And I feel like I'm, I'm good till I die. Like, mm-hmm. I'll just keep doing this, and now I'm getting paid for it. Thank you for all who support. And uh, well, it's amazing. But not everyone could start a podcast or a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I wish everyone could. <laughs> because isn't it cool to be able to, like, it's such a sacred journey people are on when you think about how that, if life is finite, if, li- if time is literally the stuff life is made of, I'm quoting Benjamin Franklin, then like time is sacred. Mm -hmm. And if people were on a course to like give their life away to things that weren't true and that was going to squander a lot of potential joy and meaning and fulfillment 
and freedom and choice. And I'm not saying that people who live religious lives live drab, dreary, lonely, miserable lives, but usually when people are in a religion, it's because they believe it's true. And if it if you find out that it wasn't what it claims to be or it's even not true, then yeah, they squander 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their precious lives giving to and paying and praying and obeying and and worshiping and following something that isn't what they thought. And so if you can give that back to them and then help Mm -hmm. them kind of get a head start so that they don't make a big mess of it and screw it all up, but instead have better relationships, better mental health, better physical health, better community, better spirituality, better meaning. That's amazing, right? That's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then not everybody can start a podcast or a YouTube channel. (laughs) No, but everyone can find a way to, to contribute, to create, to um, express themselves. And, uh, you know, it's, it is devastating to think about people who have lost so many years to Mormonism, but I'm sure you can attest to this as well, is that often those people um, now feeling a sense of scarcity of like so much time wasted are able to approach their lives with so much intention and so much beauty that it's just genuinely inspiring to be around them. And uh, we, we have mutual, plenty of mutual friends who, who are examples of that, who you just look at them and you're like, you are killing it. Like, mm-hmm. how cool. Do you, and like, some of these people left in their 50s and 60s. It's not all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Right? Yeah, no, I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And I, but, I, but I just want to offer hope because they're clients I have right now that are just like, oh, I'm 50, I'm 55, I'm 60. Mm-hmm. I'm so depressed at how much time I've wasted and that's how they think of it right now. And that's okay. Um, that like, I, I, I want to just, I don't even know if I want to continue because it's so overwhelmingly disappointing and suffocating mm-hmm. that I've wasted five, six decades wasted. I don't believe they wasted it, but mm-hmm. five or six decades that maybe I don't even want to go on anymore. And that's what sometimes I felt that after 25, I, I felt that Yeah, I get that. And don't quite get it because that is... So you felt that even in your 20s. Yeah, Mm -hmm. so I can't imagine the pain. Totally 100% valid. But um, if it's it's scarce and sacred, then, like, there is so much nectar to be, you know, squeezed from that. And um, people, you know, because you're in the work, that that doesn't have to stay that way, that life can be profound and beautiful and flourishing and all what are some things. other ways people can find it if it's not a podcast or a youtube channel well i was gonna say um just first though yeah to piggyback for what you said i keep saying piggybacking like i'm in some corporate meeting <laughs> <laughs> we um, got a good synergy here <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's why presence is important because um a, a lot of people who talk about right about presence say that time expands when you're present because y- you're not thinking about you know, this is how many years are behind me and maybe I only have this many years left. It's just like being fully in this moment is like the best way to squeeze the most out of life. Um, But then to answer your question about how can people find meaning and purpose, I think it's really useful to operate with the belief that everyone has a purpose, whether that's like one single thing or just like, you know, maybe it's just like being a loving person in the people in your life lives (laughs) you know whatever that there's so many different forms that can take but I think when you I think again presence is really important because then it then you're when you're living more intention intentionally and more consciously and I don't know I feel like that that helps you find meaning quicker and and I think if you believe that you will be led to um whatever it is that you need to do to contribute in this world, um, I think just believing that makes it a reality. Um, and I'm like, yeah, as we were as you want with that belief, like full on believe that like all the energy of the universe is like conspiring to help you because I think that can be a useful belief. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, uh, I lost my thought for just a second, but, um, okay. I just got it back. Um, it sometimes, and this isn't fair, but I'm going to say it anyway. It sometimes feels like a high demand religion is organized to distract yourself from yourself. Absolutely. Yes. It's like stay busy, yes. do your callings, go on your mission, get, get your education, get married, have kids, serve in your callings, 
get, have your have your career, and then when you're done, serve a mission until you die, and mm -hmm. serve in the temple, and you know, and it's just like boom, your life's gone, right? And then all that time, you're not even like when you're praying, you're not taught to like look inside of what you really want. You're taught to like, well, what what what's a what, is what am I supposed to want? want? What does the Holy Ghost want? And the Holy Ghost is just associations that people made where it's like uh, all the religious programming comes back into your brain as the Holy Ghost telling you how to live. And so you're literally spending your life avoiding going inside. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you referenced Jesus earlier. And I think another thing Jesus got right, he said the kingdom of God is what? Within, within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. It's within you. And that's the trick is going, you know, you talk about presence, or you talk about mindfulness and, well, you know, a way that I think about that is going still, getting mm -hmm. quiet. And it's uncomfortable because you've got trauma and you've got sadness and you've got emotions and disappointment. And it's, it's one of the most courageous things you can possibly do is just going quiet, getting still mm -hmm. and starting to get to know yourself. It's like, it sounds so... It sounds so cheesy, but it's like the great journey of mankind is just going within yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I Facing really the demons, yeah. right? If yes. I really think that's the number one most important thing is people learning how to sit with themselves. And isn't that what like every I don't know, contemplative spiritual yeah. teacher taught throughout history? Including Jesus. Including yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Jesus a lot. Except when Mormons are listening to us, they're like they're like staring at the screen. Maybe they're drooling a little bit. It's like, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. Why are they still? drooling? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like going still, getting still. Like we don't, as Mormons, we have no idea what this. This is like a foreign language. Yeah, and, it, and we have no idea what it even means. When right? I first read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, I was like, oh, the, I, it was like touch and go wherever I was, whether I was going to abandon it because it's like yeah. there's a sort of. You know, like you hear, you know, people like me in town are talk about things and it's so easy for it to sound woo woo because it's like so many of these concepts are so big, like interconnectedness. How do you describe interconnectedness to someone who hasn't like felt it? I don't know. I don't think you, I can't. I'm not like that good with words. Maybe you can. <laughs> but like. You have to experience it. It's hard. Yeah. And it takes effort. Yeah. To get there. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I always, um, who was it? The, uh like father of existentialism, Kierkegaard said, or actually it wasn't Kierkegaard. It was one of the other ones who basically said like the, there was really, really one question is that, should you kill yourself? And that Albert Camus? Yeah, I was thinking about that earlier, but I didn't want to say it. And I, 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 yeah, I obviously want to have sensitivity around suicide and uh, things like that. But I also think that that is a legitimate question is like, mm -hmm. is life worth living? what kind of life would I think is worth living? And that's what I mean when I say take yourself seriously. Like I had to sit down and say, what would I like to experience before I die? Like if I could have, if I could do anything, what would, what would be worth pursuing in the course of this meaningless, futile existence? And then in pursuing that have been the, the truly sacred moments of my life following Mormonism were not things that I achieved. Like I knew I was going to get this thing and I did it. Ha ha. It was being so surprised by joy, by being absolutely overwhelmed with something I didn't know was possible and feeling so much gratitude that I lived to experience it. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the money, the secret sauce, the, the thing that makes it worth it is when you exert the effort, when you conceptualize and pursue it, when you take yourself seriously, then you'll be surprised at what life has to offer. At least I have. And um, not always in the most dramatic ways, not always in being 10 out of 10. Um, I felt, you know, felt different connecting. You were talking about animals earlier. I started taking care of plants. I didn't think I could keep a plant alive to save my life. And I have like a ton <laughs> and a garden because it was something that uh, uh, brought me into presence and brought me into a um, into a giving mentality of a, of caretaking, of offering something to something else. And I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about Mormons feeling like, oh, I, I wasted 20 years of my life because I was in this thing that wasn't true. But I think people all around the world and throughout history have wasted their lives by 
trying to force themselves into boxes that weren't authentically them and that weren't necessarily conducive to happiness and healthiness. But I also think like using the word wasted is, I don't know, it like implies that there was some kind of other choice you could have made when that's not really true. Like you uh, presumably in a lot of these instances were born Mormon, you were, your brain was conditioned to think through the Mormon lens since you were born, like what else could you have done? Um, and there are so many scenarios where you maybe wouldn't have woken up from that and would have spent your whole life in that. And so, I mean, amazing that, you made it that, out. Any, that anyone that gets out at any point, like that's so amazing to me. And I know it's so, it's such a blessing to have got out at, you know, 22 or whatever it was, but yeah. Yeah, getting out of a high demand religion, and I'm using that term uh, in a, kind, generous way <laughs> is a major life accomplishment. I mean, Absolutely. it's something uh -huh. to, it's like Olympic gold medal, mm -hmm. Nobel prize, getting out of a high, high demand religion. Literally and how few people have been able to do it yeah. like in the history yeah. of the world. It's and an I amazing think accomplishment. so few people have the experience of like their, it's such a powerful experience to have your whole worldview crash and then like the like intellectual humility that teaches you, like there's so many good things that can come from that, that like people that aren't in high demand religions may never have that experience. Like there's so much like, um, oh, is it Khalil Gil Brown that says the, the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the greater shall be your joy. And I really believe that. And so many people with or without Mormonism or any kind of religion or whatever, don't get that experience of like watching everything fall apart and then kind of getting to rebuild because we're all put in these different boxes. John, you've said it plenty of time that it uh, it's really does like endow you with a, a superpower. We're like mutants <laughs> and uh, learning and developing what your specific power is, mm. is an amazing, incredible journey. Because we weren't built to go beyond the tribe. No. Like we were built <laughs> to stay in it no matter what. Uh -huh. So there is like... <laughs> To me, that's like evolution in action. If you're able to go beyond that, like we are wired for tribalism through and through to the point where when we find out that Joseph Smith's sleeping with 14 year old girls, we'll make like some dumb video about it where we make jokes about being a virgin and just act like it's nothing. You know, like the lengths that people will go to, to stay in that. And then like anyone that gets beyond it, wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I still feel very fortunate that I've been birthed by Mormonism because I feel like I made it to adulthood. I have a good education. I feel like I have a good basic sense of moral right and wrong. And now I get to like enjoy the rest of my life. Like mm -hmm. I feel very grateful to have been birthed through Mormonism, the Mormonism birth canal, and now to have the rest of my life to just love and enjoy. Amen. Mm -hmm. I think that's a yeah. key part of the healing process is um, – I like we do our work. People are like, "You're just angry, bitter," and it's like maybe I used I to be. Like, where but are like, you getting that from? Our videos <laughs> these days, we're like being so overly loving. Yeah, I don't, I don't. If if any, I, I don't feel it. I feel I feel genuinely grateful for my experiences. Mormon. That doesn't mean I'm. It's free from criticism, and that I like never need to talk about it again. All that it's saying is that I don't consider it as this uh, as as a bad thing for me. I see it only as a stepping stone a chapter, a, a prelude for the things that are happening now and coming that wouldn't, my life wouldn't be the same. If, if I hadn't been Mormon, I wouldn't have the life I have now. And I love the life I have now. So all I can do is be grateful for my experience as a Mormon and hopefully try to help people to experience uh, the same or similar things with less of the harmful, bad parts that I experienced and more of the good. I think it can be useful to adopt the mentality that everything happens for a reason and that everything challenging is an opportunity for growth. Another thing we haven't mentioned, well, I guess. Even if that reason is the your understanding or, or your yeah, personal yeah. giving of meaning. Whatever that means to you. Yeah. Um, and not to get like too saccharine, but gratitude, I think, is so important. We're talking about mental health and it isn't this like, it's, it's not this small thing, you know, it's not just like a cutesy like gratitude. Isn't there tons of good science now about how it does rewire your brain to find more good? And I think it's, you know, just like with compassion, you just expand it a little bit. And then it, I think it's like that with joy and like a lot of good things is like, if you just do a little bit, it, it's often like quite an exponential growth. It's something you got to cultivate for sure. Yeah. Practice. Everyone get a gratitude journal. <laughs> so now that we've reached the apex of our enlightenment for these 
two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to talk about apologetics. And <laughs> yeah. So um, interestingly, you know, in this, this is a phase that will pass, I guarantee it, because uh, most high profile apologists burn out or get burned out. But right now in 2020, at the end of 2020, we're at this phase where Fair Mormon has gotten kind of beaten down. And so they've hired some young, hip, uh, Gen Zers, Kwaku and Cardinalis. Millennials. And, are they millennials? Are they <laughs> yeah. Brad, um, Brad Whit, Bradley Whitbeck or whatever his name is. And and now they're they're trying to do these new YouTube videos that are trying to be edgy and funny and, you know, F-words bleeped out and cropping my head onto a demon. And Yeah, I didn't know and, you were Baphomet. That was kind of a nice surprise. Can I just say, we surprise. did that first. We put your head onto a demon <laughs> for our Thrive presentation. So old. Yeah, so it's a bit derivative, <laughs> it's, 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 but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> But, but it's, uh, you know, I think the Mormon church is getting super desperate, you know, and, and frankly, you guys were kind of pioneers in the sense, like, I'm not saying that you're the reason why the Mormon church has been losing millennials. Um, every religion in the United States is losing their millennials, probably at a higher rate than Mormonism uh, in, in many instances. But, you know, you guys kind of helped lead that charge. And I think a lot of people kind of looked at the church and looked at what you guys were doing and said, oh, that looks more fun. Um, maybe a little bit. But either way, the church is like desperate because they're losing their adults, but they're also losing their young people. They're losing everybody. And so they're desperately trying to hang on. Traditional apologetics hasn't worked. Traditional Mormonism isn't working. And so now they're doing this really desperate set of videos on YouTube, <laughs> F-bombs and, and sacrilege and humor and but still, you know, traditional traditional kind of apologetic scripts. Um, Somewhat belligerent as well. Very belligerent. belligerent. Well, well, the, the only thing I just want to say to set this up is you guys have been kind of having little battles with Quaku for some time. Like for you guys, it's kind of old news. For the rest of us, Quaku is kind of newer on the scene. But I just, I just want to hear whatever you guys have to say about this moment in time in Mormonism with youth and with this new brand of Fair Mormon – Quaku, Cardin, Ellis, Apologetics. What do you guys want to say about that? It's doomed to fail. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I, th I think it's all going to backfire and the effort will be disbanded. I think Quaku has a personality and a, a brand of a type of apologist and defender of the faith will persist in other forms. I don't think in such a, uh, like, carrying the stamp of the LDS church in the way that fair Mormon does, even if subtly, um, unofficially official. Yeah. Because officially I, unofficial. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that, uh, why is it going to fail? What are all the reasons it's going to fail? Well, it's exposing people. It's exposing faithful people to more of the issues because it is a safe, you know, it, if these videos do well or gain traction, then that means more eyeballs are going to be on them. Polygamy and, and Book of I, Abraham and yeah, Book of Mormon and, because, and DNA and all the problems, right? <laughs> to name but a few. Yeah. Because the truth is not on their side. And John Delin and CES uh, Letter and Jeremy Ruddle. Yeah, right? our videos are going <laughs> to pop up right below it. Shelf it, on the shelf. It yeah. doesn't bode well for them to be making these issues more mainstream They're and making people more aware of them. They're their advertising. arguments are like obviously terrible. And so <laughs> that, I mean, yeah, you might be able to like get some people with them for a while, but I just think most people deep down are smarter than that and aren't going to be like, yeah, Joseph Smith just probably didn't have sex with the 14 year olds, even though like all the other prophets did have kids with people those age. So like they obviously did, but you know, it's just like the logic is bad. The truth isn't on their side. There's the videos are just like so full of contempt. That's what surprises me the most about them is that I assume these videos are being made because people are reading the CES letter, for example, and then doubting the church. So if you want to uh, reach those people, you don't want to be ex belittling them for having doubts and you don't want to be showing contempt for them or acting like, you know, like they're stupid for you know, being affected by the CES letter. That just seems like a losing strategy. Like you haven't got the truth on your side. You haven't got like empathy and connection on your side. The jokes are bad. Like, what have you got? Good production. <laughs> they do have good production. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have two yeah. questions. So, and Tanner, you'd be thinking about what you want to say as well. Um, so one of the things, so I, I, I have this awesome opportunity where, People write John Lynch and Scott Gordon of Fair Mormon and, and like complain 
And then Scott Gordon and John Lynch give their responses. And then these people turn around and send me their responses. So I have all of Scott Ooh. Gordon and John Lynch's responses. And two of the things that are said, and I just want to get your responses to these, are the following. One is, is you know, John Lynch or Scott Gordon will go, oh, we've been putting out videos on YouTube with Fair Mormon for years, and they've gotten like 12, 12 hits or 100 hits or maybe 500 hits, and then no youth click on these things. Mm -hmm. And so now they're looking at their their metrics, at their analytics, and they're finding that younger people are actually clicking on these videos, mm -hmm. and they're getting way more uh, clicks and views and minutes watched than anything fair has ever produced. So that's that's one thing that John Lynch and Scott Gordon are, are you know, spiking the football and 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 celebrating about. Mm. Do you have a response to that? And then I have a second part of the question. Well, if you believe that the videos will achieve your purpose of like getting people to not leave the LDS church, then sure, celebrate the increased views, the increased watch time. Like what they've done is they've just gone from having zero YouTube game to having good YouTube game in the sense of good thumbnails, catchy titles, Kwaku who's got like an established brand, um, good production. And they are actors, by the way. These uh, yeah, guys are and actors, paid actors. Like more entertaining than the typical fair Mormon, like and monotone. <laughs> yeah, so like it's it's true. They are, from a YouTube standpoint, these videos are more successful. But to me, that is a, a good thing for like this side of things, like our side of it, which is like, yeah, you're good. More people are going to get exposed to the terror logic of Fair Mormon because Fair Mormon <laughs> was a big part of what made us leave the church. Well, yeah. And, and ask, that? ask, mm, I'd say how many people, if you got on ex Mormon Reddit and asked Everyone. how many of you, yeah, yeah. it was the apologist. The yeah. I'd, Fair Mormon is a gateway to leaving the church. Mm -hmm. It is. I was, I was so strict in my, um, in my study before leaving the church, I would listen to Mormon Stories podcasts, but I didn't listen to a single anti-Mormon that you had on there. I only <laughs> listened to the apologists and faithful people. And it was them who convinced me that it was all fooey. Bushman and Givens yep. and all the And people yeah, all the people who talk about the translation. It was, I forget who it was talking Dan about. Dan Witherspoon and... Yeah, there's a name. But he, as he was talking about the translation process, I was like... This doesn't hold water. Like you've punched holes in your own argument. You you you've like constructed this flimsy, flimsy explanation that can like maybe deflect this one and maybe deflect this one, but they have to contradict each other. Yeah, so. they'll use a certain logic. Like you'll see this, and we've only released one video so far, but our one that's coming out tomorrow, I think, shows this, where they'll use one, a piece of logic for something. And then they'll go against their own logic when they need to, to prove a different point. So there's zero consistency. Yeah, even if it like totally, not just in application of logic, but like the whole um, narrative that yeah. they're using, like with the Book of Mormon model, they'll be like, oh, it, 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 you know, we never said it was all of North and South America. It only had to be this tight geography model until there's a different evidence. Well, we actually found a whale bone way up in, you know, Alaska. <laughs> so therefore, and it's like, you're constantly undermining yourself. And eventually it's like, nobody wants this like weird Frankenstein's monster of Mormonism where it's just like, maybe yeah, it they was want this it it's and then, simple. That's yeah, the whole reason you're in it. That's the whole thing about <laughs> and Mormonism. And clear and true and... Yeah. yeah. So I, I think they Plain and precious truth, basically. I think they... they sh the best thing they could have done is try to keep the rap on it I think because so too. by drawing more attention to it, they're like, hey, we got a Pandora's box over here, but it's not a problem. You don't need to look in the box. We'll look in the box for you. And meanwhile, they're taking things out of the box and people are looking yeah. at the things in the box and they're like, I didn't even know this was that. Yeah, like, now I have not? to like believe in this weird logic about it. I didn't even know this was something I had to wrestle with. Yeah. Like you, you know, I could see a lot of people being like, oh yeah, polygamy, that's always disturbed me. I'm going to click on that video. And then you're getting like all these other ones by like Kinderhook plates and First Vision. And then at a certain point, it's like, okay, so all of this stuff has different explanations nothing like what I thought this religion was and that was the thing for me was just like even if this like random version is somehow it's just like not what I signed up for it's not what I want like it's just bizarre and weird and didn't teach I don't like this version of God no they did not <laughs> also even though their videos are doing like better than their other ones they're all ex-mormons watching <laughs> yeah number one a lot of ex-mormons watching also we've responded to one of their videos and i think at the, it's the polygamy one and as of the last time i checked their video had thirteen thousand views and ours has twenty six thousand views they've had to turn off the comments on their video <laughs> turn off the like to dislike ratio meanwhile we have like an amazing like to dislike ratio i think it's like two thousand likes and like yeah, 70 anything, thumbs fair mormon down. is helping us thank you fair <laughs> mormon <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. and so, many, stuff on the shelf. so many, just, just turning off likes and dislikes 
and turning off comments telling. shows that it's ex Mormon so Reddit. It's the it's the hundred and eighty thousand people on ex Mormon <laughs> Reddit that uh -huh. are all going. These videos are outrageous. And there's young people there, a lot of BYU students there, super young people. Mm -hmm. They're high school students in Utah. They're rushing to the videos, downvoting them, making mean, you know, making uh, critical comments that makes them so like believing active Mormons yeah. who are doubting. Very few of them are actually watching these videos, yeah. and they wouldn't know if they're helping these people yet. But chances yeah. are, yeah, there's no way. More, more likely than not, give it. Apologetics plus six months or apologetics plus a year. Yeah, yeah. you're out. And like, uh, they, oh, not care. Especially given the tone, it's such a yeah. turnoff. That, that that was such a huge turnoff to me, uh, as a member of the church who felt like genuine Christ like love. Um, I I remember writing about you in my Mormon journal and th and saying me, John you Dillon. John Dillon, and I never had met you. I just said I have compassion for him <laughs> because he was like he just wanted to know. And so when I saw people, you know, uh, and not you specifically, but, you know, the way they would talk about ex-Mormons and anti-Mormons, and I would just say, like, that doesn't align with how, like, my human experience. Like, I, I want, I want, I feel love, and right now I feel confused by the church, and I want to be approached with, like, loving compassion, not, like Sam was saying, just, like, put down for having doubts. So I think it's just a... It's a mess that's really gonna, <laughs> really gonna have some kickback that they're not anticipating yet. I want to hear what you're about to say, but just so we don't leave this topic, like I, it's I, I said my immediate reaction was, Christians are never gonna win by being unchristlike. That no. just doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Christ is about love and forgiveness and charity and kindness, and these videos are mean spirited. Mm -hmm. And not only are they mean spirited, and hold that thought because yeah. I want to hear it, but they're like, they lie about people like me and Jeremy Runnels. By saying we're liars, but they're lying. They yeah. lie all throughout the yeah. videos by call and, and they're calling us liars. So there's a real hypocrisy it's like there. Donald Trump. And they call, yeah, and they call, they say that me and Jeremy are intentionally trying to destroy families for profit. When I was able to show that these Mormon nonprofits like More Good Foundation, Book of Mormon Central, Fair Mormon, you add up how much money has been donated to these nonprofits in the past several years, it's tens of millions of dollars. So they're making bank, and you could argue breaking up families and lying, while they accuse people like me and Jeremy mm -hmm. of lying and breaking up families for money. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fundamentally dishonest and mean-spirited and, and fundamentally unchristlike proposition. And how do you how do you keep people in a Christian church by acting that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, granted, there will always be, I think, a uh, at least a chunk of church membership, and this is probably in any organization, that it's not about, it's not about Christ-like love. It's just about identity. Yeah. And um, even being belligerent in defense of your identity is seen as... Um, certainly by us as a warped sense, but for them a real sense of love. Mm -hmm. I'm doing, I am attacking you because I'm defending love. Which yeah, says like something about like yeah. their emotional intelligence and their perception of love. Like even when you were saying uh, like your perception of John DeLynn while we were members, I was thinking that that to me shows that you had like this higher emotional intelligence than I had. Cause I was just so sort of tribal and I don't know, like, I think lacking in empathy and emotion that I couldn't see John as like through that lens. I would have just vilified him and because that was like my tiny view of love at that time was like, yes, it is good to demonize people. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a it is a twisted like and, version and, of love. And people have sent me Quaku's responses to their criticism too. And Quaku's like, Well, Jesus in the Book of Mormon committed genocide and killed millions of people yeah. by dropping volcanoes on them. That's and, the higher power and, he believes and, in. And yeah, Christ Christ turned over the tables and he said, what a generation of vipers. Christ used ad hominem and Christ attacked uh -huh. people. And, and so they're able <sighs> to just interpret the scriptures in a way to literally justify violence, spiritual or psychological yeah. or even physical violence. I and, think what we see God as says a lot about what our highest ideals are. And like, if your highest... You know, maybe if you had like a super authoritarian parent who always put you down and treated you like you weren't good enough, that genuinely, like in a very real way, is your perception of love, you know? Like 
people who were abused as kids will think that abuse is love. Like it's this like well-known phenomenon, you know? And I feel like that applies to religion. It, it's endlessly fascinating to me to see um, what um, underdeveloped ideas we have culturally, specifically in the church, about good and evil that, um, you know, now I can, I understand that most of the harm done in society is not through conscious intent. Mm -hmm. It's almost always through unconsciousness. And so, you know, I, that's why I have compassion for Kwaku or for any of these people who, you know, are doing things that I find abhorrent um, because I can say, you know, what led a person to drop their former identity? What pain were they fleeing that they found solace in this group of people who now they get joy from uh, defending belligerently? I don't, I don't know what his experience is, but whatever it is, I can have compassion for whatever drew him to that. In the same way that you were saying that mm -hmm. uh, trauma was, you know, kind of set you up for to get, you know, sucked into an organization that, that put a, a blanket over that. And I can have compassion for that. Um, they aren't able to have that view. You know, everything that we do has to be evil. We have to be liars. intentionally liars. We're like, we're trying to destroy families. For I, money. Even if they're destroying families, I don't think they're trying to. No, right. Even mm -hmm. if they're lying, I don't think they're trying to lie. Yeah. Uh, and we come across that. We're like, do, do, they do they know that they're making such a bad argument and they just think people are dumb? And it's like, no, I don't think so. I think they yeah. just... They don't know. They're, they're trying to do what they can with the tools that they've been given. And all we can do, I think, is, you know, not, not you know, we, we do stoop a little bit to the, to the game. And we have some, I think, we have a kind of, like, friendly rapport with Kwaku I, a yeah, little Yeah, I think we try to, I mean... Without. I certainly don't see him as an enemy if it's like we're, no, we're both and entertainers. and <laughs> We generally just try to avoid him because I think we've sort of realized, okay, that's that's what that dynamic is and that we're not interested in engaging with that. But then with these Fair Mormon videos, we really saw an opportunity to like be helpful to the community and to like to young people. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's kind of why we jump back in. It's definitely in spite of Kwaku, not because of Kwaku. Yeah. He, he reached out to us a while ago or like years ago about having a formal debate and I said, listen, I'm not interested in, in like debating you. I would have a sit down and we could just talk like from a place of authenticity and ex share our experiences and give space for each other's perspectives. And he was not, he would, would not have that. It was only, we will talk about these specific points from these specific ang angles or nothing. And then, and then he like there, posted yeah. a bunch of screenshots trying to make us look bad. Cause I, I, I feel like I generally try and assume that people have good intent. So when we were chatting, I was like, oh, you'll probably do a way better job preparing for the debate than me. Haha. -ha. Like you're just being friendly. And then he like posts that as like trying to catch us out. So it just, it just felt like someone we didn't want to engage yeah, with anymore. So that, that's been our kind of policy with that sort of thing. And, yeah. and even like talking about Mormonism generally is sometimes kind of difficult because obviously there's other things that we're so much more excited about that the stuff that comes after Mormonism yeah. is so much more infinitely more captivating and exciting oh, yeah, it's real. to me. Yeah, it's, it's real. <laughs> yeah, it's um, real. But being able to help people get out of the high demand religion is also very real. So real. Yeah. And that's and, the draw. Is and there the... was definitely a lot of a lot of people reaching out to us and saying, hey, can you do this? And yeah, we can we can do it. <laughs> yeah, we could do it. Uh, why not? And I think that needing to believe that people who have different like, you know, the fair Mormon crew needing to believe that we all have evil intent and we're all deliberately lying and all those things. I feel like that just betrays insecurity and fear in them because even you, be, again, you being able to say like, I, I get why John, um, like he was just a seeker. Like, the, I don't know, there's something to that, you know, like there was less fear there. It's like you were able to confront the idea it's like they can't even confront the idea that we might be acting from good intent. Like instead of being able to be like, no, they're just wrong, which is how we see it. We're like, they're just wrong, but we don't think they have like evil intent. We just think they're trying to do as best they can within like their framework of understanding. But it's like a juvenile view to think that everyone who doesn't believe like this is evil and is doing it for bad. Re like that's such a childlike view of things. And even if even if the audience isn't processing that on, a, you know, a an intellectual level, there's still a visceral mm -hmm. sense that you get when someone is speaking from a place of um, maliciousness yeah. or or love. And I think that's the difference and that will come through. And ultimately, again, why I don't think these videos will meet their desired end. 
Uh, the <clears throat> last, the last question I had, and I think this is a good way to kind of get us, you know, we're about three hours to kind of wrap up uh, this wonderful session and maybe we need to have a lot more. Have you guys <laughs> back more? Um, but there's a, the other thing that John Lynch and, and Scott Gordon are saying is that what they're producing now, these 20 Quaku Cardinellas, Fairmore videos, that's what the young people want. That's what they need. That's their language. That's, that's, <laughs> so, so you guys are already laughing. Just imagining some Fairmore being like, that's their language. The kids <laughs> like memes. <laughs> they love to see other kids in suits. <laughs> yeah, nothing says Gen Z like kids in suits. <laughs> no, but I'm going to be vulnerable for a second and kind of get a little serious, even though I prefer humor. But <laughs> like when I first met you guys, it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a paradox because on the one hand, um, I, you know, I saw a lot of talent, a lot of intelligence, a lot of wisdom, a lot of creativity, but I, I, I was still, and still am very Mormon, very patriarchal, very old, you know, very stodgy, um, very conservative. And so like, well, if you guys were like struggling or if you guys were experimenting with things that I've always been afraid to experiment with, or if you were and not just, you know, lifestyles or approaches or philosophies, it was very easy for me to go, oh, we'll see. I'm worried about them. And are they going to be okay? And Aww. those poor those poor little guys. Papa John. I hope they figure it out. It's just right? nice to be thought about. <laughs> no, but it's but there's an arrogance, and this is as old as time. The older generations, they think they're wiser. They think their ways are good. But there's this wisdom emerging about millennials and Gen, Gen you know, Z and whatever of like, no, wait a minute. They're, they have looked at the world that their parents and their grandparents have created. They have studied it more than their parents or grandparents ever did. They've thought about it more than their parents or grandparents ever did. And they've actually intentionally rejected a lot of the things that we're all looking down our noses, well, where's your steady six figure job with benefits and where's your traditional family and where's your kids? And, you know, where's all this conservative stuff? Whereas it, in so many instances, the, the student becomes the master, right? Where, where the, where it turns out the kids are wiser than the adults. Right. And so I'm coming from a place of having been a little bit judgmental or uh, stodgy or looking down my nose a bit with this humility. And now that I have, I have kids your age, right? And my kids are brilliant like you guys. And they teach me stuff all the time. Like I'm on my knees trying to heal and grow so I can be a better parent to my kids who are way smarter and wiser than me in so many instances. And so I guess I'm kind of handing you a softball. But my impression is there is a real undervaluing or underestimating of Gen Z or millennials in the statement that John Lynch and Scott Gordon make that like, this is what, this is the type of discourse that these kids these days want and need. Yeah. So there's the softball. Now you guys hit it out of the park. <laughs> well, it's, it's reducing young people to just wanting like memes and jokes and like smash cuts Zing. <laughs> and it's like no young people are thinking more critically they're more concerned about social justice they're more concerned about like researching things and not just taking what their parents say is true believing authority, um right? i think there is a massive i mean there's a massive increase in awareness about mental health and self-love and um yeah all of the stuff that comes with that which these videos feel like so <laughs> juxtaposing to um yeah and and have like growing up with the internet literally is an expanded consciousness you a, a teenager today can scroll through their phone for 10 minutes and absorb more information than a medieval peasant would in their whole life if a medieval peasant looked at twitter for 10 seconds their head <laughs> would literally explode <laughs> be too much to process and so and not just absorbing information, but again, seeing the interconnectedness of these things like, oh, I see that the products I'm buying are affecting is affecting people in Malaysia. Like what? In ways that our parents never thought about. It's just bah, 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 still my thing. Still though, still yeah, still don't. Yeah. Where does the gas come from? Where does the plastic go? Doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> but kids are worried about that, and they're they're um, concerned with how their institutions and how them personally are fitting into this global community. And what Fair Mormon's attempt is seems to be like 
you know, closing the blinders in, like, we've got it all okay. You know, we've got this little Pandora's we've box and it's names. all good. We can do it. And that's not, that's not what they care about. What they care about is what is the church doing to mm-hmm. be a player in this international global uh, stage? And how are we being a force for good? How are we, how are we actually reaching out in love to people who are different than us? How are we embodying these Christian principles of acceptance and love and compassion? Like, that's what they care about. And again, why this is going to be so detrimental, because it's not, it's not speaking to any of that. It's showing how small-minded and how truly, like, lacking in vision Mormonism is, how little it offers the global uh, dialogue. Um, you know, we have a prophet in the last days who can give us all these answers. Okay, cool. Well, we're dealing with, what are the with catastrophic <laughs> climate change that's going to affect me for the rest of my life. What is the prophet saying about that? Um, we've got... Um, police violence, you know. Like, yeah, all these like, all these actual issues d- that are going on. And it's like... Democracy in jeopardy, right? Give like, saying. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's no, no substantive commentary on any of this. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. Poverty, uh, hunger, water, you know, national disasters. I I just think it's a little bit presumptuous for someone, (laughs) (laughs) uh, for I don't know how old Lynch or any of these people are, but to presume that they know what younger people want is a little iffy. I don't know. I I think a lot of what I saw a, a thing that the church put out, like some sort of youth gathering where it was all scripted. I saw that. You know that wasn't about? recent, yeah. though, was it? Within the last five, ten years. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the last ten years, maybe, yeah. Hey, and everybody, I, come on, clap your hands. Yeah, right? and like, I would walk straight out of there as a Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> like, and kids younger than me certainly have no patience for that. They don't want some, you know, like, hyper-scripted, it almost is like a parody of a parody. Like when they, you know, when the fair Mormon kids talk, it, it sounds like brother. It sounds like a brother Jake video. Like not a problem. Like everything's fine. It's like a parody. Don't worry about that. <laughs> We've got all the answers. And it's like you're talking to me like you're not even a real human. Like well, how am I supposed to feel like comforted when you can't even talk to me like a real human being? Yeah, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's such a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, and I love the, this vibe of let's not let's not return ad hominem with ad hominem. Mm-hmm. Let's look at them compassionately. I do think it's kind of weird. So just this is just a little bit of story. But a couple years ago, CNN reached out to me, and it's this guy Kamau Bell, who's got a, a, a series called United Shades of America, and he's a he's a, a black you know American guy, and he goes around the country and has these little episodes where he just spotlights little small towns or, you know, little microcultures within America. It's great. Well, he comes, he, he's planning a trip to Salt Lake City, he comes to Utah and he, and he reaches out to me and he reaches out to Kwaku and he says, I want to have a, a, a the conversation between Kwaku and John DeLynn. This is two years ago. So we meet at a diner and there's a photo of this on my Facebook page right now of me and Kwaku and Kamau Bell. And, uh, and so we meet at this diner and I didn't know a lot about Kwaku. So like Kwaku's telling Kamau Bell the story. And and I was like, Kwaku's like, oh yeah, I joined the church like three or four years ago. And I was like, you've only been a member like three or four years? And part of me was like really impressed with how much he knew about Mormonism, having been a member for so little time. Mm-hmm. But then but then like we start getting into a conversation about race. And of course I'm like trying to tread lightly because he's <laughs> black and I'm white, but I'm trying to talk about how the church has been racist. And so I'm talking about when I was in seminary and when I read Mormon doctrine, what I was taught and how that affected me. And every time I'm telling Kamau Bell the genuine racist Mormon experience that I experienced in the Book of Mormon, and it's super racist, you know, Quaker was like, that's not what the church teaches. That's not what, you know, the church teaches. That's not what people are taught in seminary. And here, Quaker, you know, I thought in my mind. Well, you've never been to seminary. Quaker's been a Mormon <laughs> for like 15 minutes. <laughs> and I'm 50. And he's telling me, well, I would never go into the African-American community and tell them what it was like to be black. Yeah, but he's he's been a Mormon for 25 minutes. <laughs> and he's going to tell me what the Mormon experience is. And it, mm. and it was really like bizarre. Um and and kind of sad and hurtful, but also like the Twilight Zone and kind of mm. gaslighty. But then it it is kind of weird that that Fair Mormon has turned to Quaku and said, "Write these things," as if Quaku really knows us. Mm. I mean, yeah. he knows some things. He knows 
he knows more than me in some areas, but does he really, like, who should be writing these things? It should be people that really know us, not mm-hmm. somebody who's been with us for just a couple of years. It, that part was weird to me. You know? well, well, one thing we noticed is like they don't even they said they've said things in their videos that Fair Mormon disputes on its own website, so it doesn't seem like there's that much oversight. Yeah, that is weird. And like, so I feel like Quake, who's it's about his brand, and it's like there's not. I mean, can you think of? I can't think of another like millennial content creating Black Mormon off the top of my head. Or content creating Mormonism of the same in yeah. the same. Yeah, sphere. like he, it's a, it's a pretty small niche, and he's like built a name for himself within that, and so it's like, you know, he's a big fish in a small pond. It makes sense that they would pick him. And he's also wanting to do it. Like, right. not, I imagine there's not that many people that are gunning to make apologetics videos because yeah. typically, like, I mean, how many young people are getting that into apologetics and staying? Yeah, that's the thing is like young people don't care about I we're anomalies that we got into it at all. Most people, most young people are just like to hell with all of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. You lost me at the very beginning. That's you didn't even kids. have to go into the yeah. cult stuff or yeah. death oaths or any, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was out at having to be there every bored. Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I guess what I'm saying not to bash Quaku, it's just the, the videos aren't Mormon. Yeah. No. Yeah, they're just not Mormon. No. They're 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 they polarizing and I think that will it'll do its job. Like any polarizing figure, it will bring some people out of the woodwork. The people who are already converted, the people who weren't gonna get out of it anyway, whose idea identity is far too staked in it for them to ever want to venture out. And for those people, it'll get them more hyped and maybe more radicalized, however you radical you get in the Mormon apologetic community. Um but for the vast majority, I don't think it's going to capture or generate interest, let alone sympathy. My anxiety was never higher than when I was reading apologetics. I felt like I was on the verge of a breakdown. Like I had my first panic attack in that time period. Mm-hmm. I got very scared of like psychosis in a way. Like I was very scared of demons and it just sh- sent my anxiety through the roof because I think the cognitive dissonance is so intense. Even if you're, I don't know, you can, depending on how desperate you are to cling to your Mormon identity, which is like obviously very desperate in most cases like that, you can survive it for a while, but like how much pain can someone bear? Or like how much, how long can someone bear cognitive dissonance for? I don't know. It's unhealthy. It's different per person, but yeah, it is unhealthy. So I'll ask you guys to do something that you may or may not want to do, or maybe you'll think it's fun. If the church came to you and said, here's a hundred grand, how do we keep young people? What what would you advise the church as consultants to do? How do they keep, oh. you know, 20 somethings, teens? How, if, if Quaku's brand, if Fair Mormon's videos aren't the way to do it, what can the church do to keep from hemorrhaging its its young people? <laughs> Love your neighbor, get rid of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. The, uh, yeah. But then do you need Mormonism for that? No, nope. but you can make <laughs> use of the organization and, you know, it's, the ward and stake and all those systems are useful. If you could mobilize Mormons to do good in the world and to, you know, don't spend three out two hours now on Sunday listening to bullshit about Joseph Smith, like go out and, and do something. Yeah. Unfortunately, all the changes we'd recommend would like absolutely disintegrate. Yeah. The, render it obsolete. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, but yeah, that type of thing, like stop sending mis- proselytizing missions, like, do service missions, mm-hmm. at least make that an option. Mm. Um, but actual service, not, yeah. <laughs> not this idea Teaching that... English to then put <laughs> them into a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. the discussions. Um, that type of thing. I mean, they would have to, they'd have to, some of the truth claims would just have to go, they would have to let the Book of Mormon mm-hmm. slide as like, like the community of Christ has done. Like, this is a founding document. We don't have to take it as literal if we don't want mm-hmm. to. I actually think they'll go that way eventually. I think they're, they are going I think they're way. setting yeah. the yeah, stage the to eventually say, yeah. we've always said it like this uh, because they can draw from little things it's here and there. It's about the spiritual nature of the book. Yeah, it's even Oaks, Oaks book. recently said something to that effect. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, he, he's on to it. Yep. <laughs> um, so that, the- that'll be a change. Uh, the deference to the prophet and to authority generally 
young that that's never been a message that resonates with young people at least not since the 60s or 50s we bought it or our generation bought it. <laughs> doing it yeah mormons i guess but now it's there's just it's there's too much information yeah, yeah, and yeah. too much yeah. chaos of information i didn't have google no if yeah. i had google it'd be a different story totally if i mean I that's why we're out. stories it'd be a different story <laughs> totally right? yeah. totally yeah and yeah. we did and that's why yeah. we're out um <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a lot of a lot of that stuff would just have to go. A lot of the literalism, um, they'd have to basically just be the community of Christ. And even then, the community of Christ, I don't think, is like has a super robust mm-hmm. young young population. And then there's stuff for women, right? The way women are treated. Yeah, it yeah, it doesn't really feel like you could turn it around. <laughs> because I, I was going to say maybe there's a way you can sort of acknowledge the church's history and be like, yeah, this was never really true. But like we can still like honor the stories of our ancestors and like, you know, nothing's truly good or bad. And like maybe take the good, leave the bad. But then I'm like, why do young people, why would they want to show up every week? Why would they want to keep your tithing video made me realize, oh, shit, they really hammered home tithing. And that's got to be for like. There's no way they're all just saying you got to pay tithing purely from like a spiritual perspective. There has to be something, you know, they have to be talking about how like we need to get everyone to be paying tithing because we have to meet these business goals. It is a, it's a money making venture. Yeah. And so you always have to have though that whole system in place when pure religion undefiled would just be a sincere desire to help others to connect with the transcendent on your own personal level and then coming together with people who shared that intention to to do things like that together and you don't need all these committees and you don't need all the buildings and you don't need the white shirts and ties and the dresses but without all that stuff you don't make the money so (laughs) so they can't just give women the priesthood and accept lgbt people and you guys are right back in it you'd have to get rid of the priesthood come on (laughs) swap it out with like some kind of grief ritual or something <laughs> yeah people people Buddhism. yeah people ask us pretty frequently like um would you come back if for just the community or whatever and i'm like no that's just the most stale <laughs> so <dry>. stale. <laughs> uh, yeah none of it doesn't none of it feels real it just doesn't feel real but when you're in it and you can't really conceive of community outside of that i get why people it's like the only thing it's that's such real. a good community uh-huh. it's all that's real yeah. yeah nothing else is real when you're in it yeah yeah right yeah, it's weird. It's weird looking back and knowing that I might, I have most of my roommates are not don't have a Mormon background, which is interesting living in Utah because like everybody here is ex Mormon, and we've been watching a lot of cult documentaries together, <laughs> and people are like, how can they believe? Like, how can they be stuck in that? And I'm like, you don't get it. Like, <laughs> I was in that, and you can get high on that. That's the thing too. Is like, I don't know. You're like most high moments as a Mormon, you're like. Mm. Mm-hmm. In God mode, and it's power. It's powerful stuff. It is. And it also comes with a really, really heavy uh, withdrawal. Uh, yeah, withdrawal and uh, uh, crash. Yeah, crash. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, I could talk to you guys forever. Um, so, uh, so check these awesome. I'm going to give them a chance to give closing comments, so you guys can be gathering your final thoughts. Um, but I'm going to do the shameless plug. Zelf on the Shelf YouTube channel. Click like, follow, subscribe, share it with everybody. You can donate to them at PayPal or at um, Venmo and join on Patreon. You can buy their merch, buy their shirts, buy Tanner's um, paintings, check out Samantha's music on Spotify, all those good things. Let's have a closing uh, wrap-up statement by both of you. Uh, we'll have Tanner go first and then we'll end with the bang with, uh, with Samantha and I'll just, you guys gave me a funny look. Is that a <laughs> benevolent sexism? No, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I just want to say, I adore you guys. I think of you as dear friends and even family in a way. I'm so, uh, I don't want to sound paternalistic, but Please I'm, so sound proud paternalistic. Of, I'm so proud of what you guys have done. <laughs> And uh, you were like years ahead of me. Like I'm just now trying to figure out YouTube and realizing the importance of that media. You guys have been doing it forever and doing it so well. And I think your your future is even brighter than what you've done. So hats off to you. I adore you guys. I, I, I am not worthy 
I'm uh, I am just in <laughs> awe of your Shut talents, up. And, <laughs> and I wish you guys the best. And I want everyone to support you because you deserve support. Having said all that, uh, closing statements. We'll begin with you, Tanner. Just want to, first of all, thank you, John, for all the support over the years. I feel like in a, you really helped us get on the map in the beginning and have always been so supportive of us, both as a collective enterprise and individually. You've been a really good friend, so thank you so much. And um, a closing statement, gee, I don't know. I just uh, I feel a lot of gratitude to be where I am, to have the experiences that I've had. I, I feel like I'm... <clears throat> I kind of said this when we were talking earlier. I felt like I got what I was looking for um, in in Mormonism. I was I feel like a true spiritual seeker, and I was always seeking a Mormonism. And I feel like ever since then I've been a finder, and I just keep finding and finding and finding, mm. and my joy increases. And not to say that I'm just like I said, ten out of ten every day, just ding 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 ding. It's not like that at all. It's just a a personal content <clears throat> with life and um, feeling at peace with who I am and my placement in the world and uh, feeling so grateful for the, the experiences that I get to have and, and for Mormonism shaping that experience and uh, a lot of gratitude for all the people who have been so supportive of us, supportive of you, because that's also been part of our support as well. Um, it really does take collective effort. It takes a village to raise a child and we're all we're all children <laughs> raising to the grave. So uh, uh, we need each other. And um, if there's any way that we can be helpful to the people who watch our stuff, we're, we'd love to hear mm -hmm. um, people's ideas and help where we can. Beautiful. Yeah. Amen to everything Tana said. Um, I don't know that I have anything else to say except for um, there have been various times over the years where I've kind of wanted to take a step back from making X woman content. And then I always get pulled back in and like reminded of why I care so much. Um, Cause sometimes being a convert, there's like a sense of, you know, I, I wasn't born in this. So I, wh why am I still, you know, there's like, I think there was a, a sense of shame, you know, for joining and it's complex, but it, it's just been like a really amazing experience to be a part of a community of people who are transcending these, limiting beliefs about who they are and what life should be and what's possible for them. Um, I, there's so many beautiful people in this community. Um, yeah, I guess like, I just want to say that I'll keep trying to like contribute <laughs> however I can. Um, and John, you're amazing. And thank you for everything you've done. And I love your new YouTube series. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And everyone who talks shit about you <laughs> is dead to me. <laughs> you have to mention your cats. And shout out to Bernie and Banksy. I know you guys are watching this. We couldn't do this You're without both you. You're perfect angels. <laughs> Shut the fuck up at night. <laughs> now get to bed. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, I'm not going to end by saying uh, donate to Mormon Stories. I'm going to end by saying give these guys your money. They deserve it. If you don't like Fair Mormon's videos or <laughs> if you like Mormon stories, donate to Zelf on the Shelf because they're reaching uh, Gen Z, Gen Y, millennials better than anybody. And, you know, these are people that need to be reached and uh, they're doing amazing work. So support them. Do it for me. Do it for them. Do it for humanity. Uh, do it for Banksy. Uh, <laughs> do it for clickbait. God rest <laughs> his or her soul. Um, do it for all those reasons. And uh, thanks for joining us. This has been amazing. You guys are awesome. Stay in touch. And we'll see you guys again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank uh, you. My heart Aww. feels warm. I got so warm and fuzzy at the end. <laughs> Oh, uh, how fun to be back on Mormon Stories. Three hours, it just... Three and a half. Blink of an eye. Presence. <laughs>